Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the morning session. Uh, this session is on network function, and the first talk will be by invited talk by Sergeant Ostoges from Ecole Normale Superior. The title is The Role of Population Structure in Computation Through Neural Dynamics. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, after the late night poster session, part is the change of time and <laughs> all the other challenges. So thanks a lot for, for, for the invitation. Um, it's, it's really a great pleasure and great honor to, uh, to be on the stage here. So COSEN is the, the conference I, I grew up with and it completely shaped uh, um, the research I, I have been doing. Uh, so before I start, um, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the people who, who did the work that I will be presenting today. Uh, so this whole line of uh, research uh, started with a truly exceptional PhD student uh, and more truly collaborator, uh, Francesca Mastro Giuseppe. Uh, and the work I will be presenting today was, uh, was led by um, uh, Manuel Beran, Adrian Valente, two, two, two other fantastic students, uh, along with uh, Alexi Giboy, who was a postdoc uh, in my lab. So uh, the goal of research in my, my lab is to use uh, mathematical models to understand how uh, millions of neurons in the brain work together to produce computations that underlie behavior. And currently in the community, uh, there's an apparent dichotomy between two big types of approaches for understanding how neurons lead to, to behavior. The, the historical approach is uh, to try to assign functional meaning to individual neurons uh, by, by sorting uh, neurons into classes based on how they re respond to different uh, task variables. So the textbook examples, uh, uh, of course, are simple and complex cells uh, um, in V1, uh, place cells, grid cells, head direction cells, and many others in, in the navigation system. And similar classifications have been attempted in higher cortical a area with uh, neurons proposed to, to code for more abstract uh, uh, variables such as choice, uh, category, rules, and so on. So uh, this, this, is, this approach has been very popular, but it, it's, it kind of reached its limit about 10 years ago when the whole field, and in particular the, the COSEN community, uh, started to acknowledge that these examples are really uh, exceptions rather than the rule, uh, because most, most of the neurons, especially in higher cortical areas, uh, tend to re respond to, to multiple task variables or generally mixtures of, of task variables. So th this led to the emergence of this concept of um, mixed selectivity, uh, which was made popular in two seminal papers, which are now exactly 10 years ago. Uh, and in particular, the, the, the paper by uh, Valerio Monte and uh, David Cicillo, when they were in the, in the labs of Bill Newsom and, and, um, and Krishna Shinoi, uh, well, looked at an extension of the classical random dot task, um, in which uh, the stimuli, so the dots had emotion, but they also had a color. And depending on the contextual cue, the animals needed to make a choice, either depending on motion or depending on, on, on color. And so Valerio Monte recorded the activity of a large number of neurons uh, in, in the prefrontal cortex, cortex without pre-selecting them. And, and he saw that some neurons look like classical choice neurons, um, but most neurons, in fact, uh, respond to, to, to mixtures of, of, of task variables. And the task variables here are uh, motion, color, uh, choice, and, uh, and context. So, um, the activity of individual neurons uh, is, is, is really hard to interpret. So instead of looking at individual neurons, so this paper popularizes this approach, which is really the standard at COSAN, uh, and which is to look at the population as a whole and represent activities in uh, what has been called the neural state space or the activity state space, so where each axis is the activity of one neuron. And uh, the activity of the, uh, of the population then is represented as a trajectory in time in, in this space. And so the overarching idea is that the fundamental units of computations are not individual neurons, but, but instead uh, distributed patterns of activity or latent variables, so a very popular word here. And so now this is, of course, uh, a very high dimensional uh, space, but as, as we all know, so many studies have found that activity is actually confined to low dimensional subspaces. So usually the next step is to look for low dimensional projections that extract the core uh, of the computation. And, and, and in this paper by Valerio Mente and, and David Cicillo, they, they found a very compelling projection, uh, 
so, it's, so here I'm showing a two-dimensional projection. So one axis represents the stimulus, in particular the motion of the stimulus, the other axis represent choice. And so projections on this two-dimensional plane, well, suggest a mechanistic picture where uh, the trajectories of the dynamics of activity transform information about the stimulus into information about, about, about the choice. Uh, okay, so this is this is really a very compelling picture, and beca it became a, a basis or an example of, of what has be become a broader conceptual framework, uh, which has been called uh, computations uh, through uh, through population di dynamics. And this 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 framework posits that we should think of computations in terms of uh, well low dimensional uh, the trajectories in the in the state space, where in particular the, the non linear um, dynamics of, of, of these latent variables uh, while transforming inputs in, 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 into, into outputs. And, and so within this, uh, this framework, the analysis of the geometry of neural um, activity in state space is, is usually combined with the analysis of, of networks trained uh, mm -hmm. on, on the same task as the animals. And so, uh, so analyzing the, the activity in, in the, this network models then provide a way to interpret the dynamics in, in the experiments. And so altogether, this, this computation through dynamics approach has, uh, has, has been very successful. In, and and I, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the, the huge um, influence and role that, uh, that Krishna Shinoi has, been, uh, has had in, in developing those ideas and propagating them, uh, in particular, the, the COSIN community. So, uh, so, so this has been a, yeah, a very successful uh, uh, approach. Um, it gives us a mechanistic picture, but within this approach, uh, well, the, this concept of cell classes just d d does not really have a role. So there's, uh, this, this approach is completely agnostic to, 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 to the concept of, of cell classes. It's, it essentially assumes that the total neurons are uh, statistically equivalent. Yet, uh, there is overwhelming biological evidence that not all neurons are equivalent, and uh, enormous efforts uh, have been invested in, in building increasingly detailed atlases of biological cell classes uh, based on biological properties such, such as gene expression, morphology, and physiology. But how, how these biological properties and, and these biological cell classes uh, map onto computation is, 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 is really not understood right now. Uh, so, so currently we're in the stage in the field where this is an apparent big divide between between two set of, of approaches, and and yeah, this is, this has appeared repeatedly during the, during this conference. So, uh, on one side, there's an approach where it tries to classify individual neurons in, 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 into some types of cell classes, and on the other hand, we, we have a computational approach which thinks in terms of collective dynamics and does not seem to have a use, direct use for this concept of, of, of cell classes. So the fundamental question that, um, that we addressed is, uh, are these two paradigms mutually exclusive or should they be combined in some way? And more specifically, so starting from, from a computational point of view of, of, of collective dynamics, um, so the, the question we wanted to address is, do we ever need to think in terms of some, some, some concept of cell classes to understand how, uh, how computations are, are, are performed. And to, to address this question, the first step is really that we need to have a meaningful concept of, of functional cell classes. So what is clear, what I already told you, is that we need to give up the idea that individual neurons encode individual task variables. There's overwhelming evidence that neurons are mixed selective. Uh, but does this mean that the selectivity is completely random? Or could we still identify groups of neurons that share similar patterns of selectivity wh while still being mixed selective? And uh, a number of studies have, have addressed this question uh, recently. And I, I'm going to illustrate the, the type of approach that, that has been developed. Uh, well, based on, based, uh, on this context-dependent decision-making task. So the way these approaches work is that they start by, for every neuron, they start by quantifying the selectivity to different task variables. And the simplest way to do this is, is a linear regression. And, and so then, um, so, so in this task, well, there are four task variables. So there's motion, uh, color, choice, and context. And so for every neuron, well, we have four numbers which uh, quantify the, the selectivity to, 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 to these four task variables. So every neuron can be re represented 
in something that we call the selectivity space. So where every X is now is the selectivity with respect to one task variable. So, and then every neuron is, is, a, is a point in this space. And so in this example here, so we have four task variables. So this is a four dimensional uh, state space. And, and here, so this plot shows different two dimensional projections of, of, of this two, uh, four dimensional space. So every neuron is a point here. And then the population is actually a cloud of points uh, in the selectivity space. And then the question we can ask is, is, is this cloud uh, completely random in some sense, or does it have some structure? And if, if it does have some structure, can we somehow group neurons into functional cell classes that, that have a computational meaning? Um, and so the, the lab of Anne Churchland has, uh, has pioneered this line of work. And um, I'm going to, uh, to spend a bit of time illustrating the, the approach they, um, uh, they, ha they have developed uh, by showing you some, some cartoons, essentially. So Im imagine that you have two data sets, uh, so represented in, in selectivity space. Now, again, so here I'm showing only a two-dimensional projection, but it, this, this selectivity space could be higher dimensional. Um, and so the first question is, so is there any structure in, in, in this distribution. And so the way to address this question is to, to compare each data set with, with a null distribution, which represents completely random selectivity. And a natural null distribution uh, here, well, uh, is, is a multivariate Gaussian, which can have some, some, some correlations, but this is the only structure in, in the null distribution. So the first step is to, to fit a Gaussian to the, to, 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 to the data set. And then the question is, uh, well, is the underlying data set different from the fitted Gaussian or not? And, and so this is usually addressed by looking at the summary statistics. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the, into the details of, of that. Um, so, so basically, well, we get a comparison between the, the, between the data and the fitted uh, Gaussian distribution. So if, if the difference is not significant, then we're going to, to call this a fully random population structure or, 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 or no, no structure. While if, if, if the distribution deviates from, from a Gaussian, then we'll call this a non-random population structure in the sense that there is structure additional to, to, um, to, to, to just a simple Gaussian. Um, so if, uh, if, if we have deviations from the Gaussian, uh, then, um, then we can go one step further, so, and we, want, we can try to get a better statistical de description, so go beyond the Gaussian. Uh, and th there are many ways to go beyond the Gaussian, but uh, one natural approach is uh, to, to apply a clustering algorithm, and this defines subpopulations based on this structure in selectivity space. So, so this provides a definition, so a concept of functional uh, subpopulations, and then the next step is try to understand, well, whether these identified subpopulations uh, have um, a computational role um, or not. Okay, so this, this was all uh, just an illustration. Um, and, but uh, so Anne Churchill's lab has applied this, this approach a while ago to, to data recorded uh, in the parietal cortex during a, a, a multi-sensor decision-making task. And in that original study, uh, well, they actually found no structure. So they found no deviations from this uh, Gaussian null hypothesis. And so they, are, they argued that there was no category that the, 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 the selectivity structure was fully random. Now, more recent studies, in particular studies from Adam Kepich lab, about which we, we heard uh, yesterday, and, and several papers in, in the last year or two, um, instead found uh, a non-random structure, so a deviation from, from a purely Gaussian distribution. And then they, they, they clustered the data and they identified cell classes, which then they related to, to the computations and to, to the underlying uh, connectivity. And now, so well, this is an interesting situation because we have a set of conflicting results here. So on, on, one, on one side, so we have studies that, uh, that find no structure, on the other side, uh, studies that find structure. And, and so this, this raises a number of, um, uh, of questions. Uh, so, so the first question, so this, this concept of cell classes that I just introduced in the previous slide, is, is this, this is the right way of, of thinking about uh, functional cell classes? Uh, specifically, do, 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 do cell classes actually play a, a computational role? And could it be that perhaps specific computations require 
a cell class structure while others uh, do not. Um, Okay, so, 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 so these are really fundamentally theoretical questions that uh, we can address by looking at, at, at network models. And so this is, this is what we have done. So uh, we have built on this recent trend, which is, well, we know do dominates cosine, which is to use uh, recurrent neural networks as, as, as models of, of neural computations. So recurrent neural networks have a very nice model system. They can be trained to perform any task, in particular the same task as the animals, um, and so we, 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 we get systems that are constrained only by the tasks they're performing and in which we have full access to the connectivity to the activity and then we can an analyze both connectivity activity and, and also manipulate uh, both uh, connectivity and activity. And so, so then we can use this, well, this model system to, to, to try to understand in which cases we really, we really need uh, an organization in cell classes to understand computations. Okay, so what we did is, is so we, we considered a, a series of classical uh, systems in neuroscience tasks. So starting uh, from, uh, from perceptual decision-making and going to uh, parametric working memory, multi-sensory decision-making, so this is the task that Dan Churchin's lab looked at, uh, con context-dependent decision-making that I already introduced, and then uh, delayed match to sum. And so for each task, we, we trained a bunch of uh, recurrent neural networks to, to perform the task. And then the first question we ask is whether these networks um, so show any structure in the selectivity based in this metrics that I had just introduced, this idea of functional self classes in the selectivity space. Um, okay, so let me illustrate again how this works. So, so for each trained RNN, so we can generate activity from the model and then we can um, basically regress, for every neuron we can regress its activity with respect to task variables so for every neuron, this gives us a bunch of uh, regression coefficients, so, so, so selectivity coefficients. And then so we can represent, uh, well, every neuron in this selectivity space, so where each axis is, is one, of, uh, one task variable, and, and the whole network then becomes a cloud of points in this selectivity space. And here I'm il illustrating two, two different networks, just, just as, as examples. And then the next question is whether this cloud of, of points is, is significantly different fr from a Gaussian. So we can fit a Gaussian distribution, which, which can have some correlations. And then we check how far the distribution of points deviates from, from this Gaussian. And so if there are no significant deviations, we can tell, say that the selectivity structure is random. And if there are deviations, then we can quantify them and, 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 and say how, well, how non-random the structure is. Okay, so, so this is the analysis and so here are the results. So for every network, so every task and every network, uh, so here uh, we can plot the, the amount of structure that we find in, in the selectivity, so which is the amount of the deviation from, from a Gaussian distribution. And we get a picture that looks interesting. Uh, so we have three tasks in which there are basically no, um, no significant deviations from, from a Gaussian and two tasks where we have strong deviations. Okay, so, so this, is, this, this is interesting. So it suggests that maybe some tasks don't need structure, while other tasks need, need some kind of uh, class structure. But uh, at this point, it's very hard to conclude anything from these analyses. So these analyses are purely correlational. Uh, they don't really tell us whether this identified structure plays any role in, in computation. So what we really wanted to get is, is kind of a causal mechanistic understanding of whether this structure plays a role in, in computations or not. So we really wanted to understand how, uh, how networks perform these tasks. Now, um, so I told you that RNNs are great systems because uh, we have full access to connectivity and activity, but they're still very, very hard to understand because these are high dimensional, uh, non-linear dynamical systems. And we simply don't have the mathematical tools to fully understand what, what they're doing. Uh, so what we need are, are simplified models that are easier to understand, but still rich enough to, to implement um, a, a, a large uh, range of tasks and, uh, um, and mechanisms. And so, 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 so in my team, we have been working with, with a class of simplified models, uh, which we have been calling uh, lower rank uh, uh, RNNs. Uh, and, and so this is a subclass of, of general RNNs in which the connectivity matrix uh, obeys particular constraints. So specifically, it is constrained to, 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 to be a lower rank matrix. And so you can think of this as uh, basically um, 
keeping only a small number of modes in the connectivity matrix, but apart from this, keeping fully nonlinear dynamics. Okay, so this low rank structure, so it, it means that uh, the connectivity can be actually described in terms of a small number of, of vectors over neurons, uh, which come in, in two types. So we have column vectors and row vectors, and, and, and these are in principle different and play different, the different roles. Uh, and, and they fully uh, determine the, the, the connectivity. Okay, so now before I go further, so why is this an interesting class of models? So why did we look at this class of models? Well, when, um, when we started this, this work with, uh, with Francesco Master Giuseppe, uh, we realized that this type of low rank structure is actually hidden in, in many, if not most, uh, recurrent neural networks models in, in, in the computational neuroscience literature, starting from very, very classical models such as, um, well, Hopfield networks or, 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 or the ring network uh, um, and so on, going, going towards more, more recent frameworks. Uh, more recently, we realized that also a lot of models in the statistical literature rely on the same kind of structure. In particular, recently, we showed that this class of models is directly related to, to the very popular class of latent dynamical systems. So this is joint work with Jonathan and Pillow. Um, and we and others have also shown that training networks through backpropagation actually induces low, low, low rank structure. So this is, this is joint work with, with, with Omri Barak and, and Friedrich Schussler. But um, really, the main reason uh, for us to focus on this class of models is that, it, is that they're very tractable and very interpretable, while remaining highly expressive in a, in a sense that they're, they, they, they're universal approximators. They can implement any computation. Okay, so I told you that these, these models are interpretable. So interpretable has been probably the, the keyword of... Uh, of of the of cosine this this year. So 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 what does this mean in this context? So let me. I'm going to to give you a very brief overview of of the theory of of low rank um, uh, recurrent networks. So in 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 low rank networks, uh, well, the, the network is, is is fully specified in terms of vectors over neurons. So the the pattern the patterns of input weights are vectors over neurons. The the readouts are are vectors over neurons. And the connectivity is fully specified by this um, row and column uh, ve vectors o o over neurons. And, and, and so these this connectivity vectors they fully determine the dynamics and, and the computations. And so how can we think about these vectors and the relationship b between them? So there, there are two complementary ways of, of looking at the structure. So we can start by stacking these, these vectors next, next to each other, and then we get, a, we get a matrix. And then we can either look at the at the rows or at the columns of this matrix. Now, as, as I told you before, so the columns of these vectors of this matrix are vectors over neurons. And then we can think of these vectors as specific directions in the neural state space. So more, more specifically, so we can show that in this class of models, so this connectivity structure confines the activity to, to lie exactly in, in the low dimensional subspace of, uh, of the neural state space. And this, this low dimensional subspace is in fact a span, it's determined by these, by these connectivity vectors. And so because the activity is low dimensional, so we can represent it in terms of a small number of latent variables. So in fact, we get one latent variable for every unit rank term in, in the connectivity. And then we have a mathematical theory which actually describes the dynamics of these latent variables uh, in terms of an effective circuit which specifies well how how these latent variables interact among themselves and with with the inputs. So, so the key point is is really that any low rank network can be reduced to uh, exactly reduced to to, to 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 an effective description in terms of an effective circuit, which then really. Um, uh, the, represents the, the computations. It, it, it determines how inputs are transformed into outputs through dyna dynamics, uh, exactly in the way that the, the original picture of uh, of um, uh, Valerio Monte and David Susilo uh, suggested. Now, the key point is that the dynamics in this effective circuit um, is is determined by the relationship between the vectors, in particular, the relationship between the entries and the different vectors. Uh, and to visual this relationship, it is useful to take a complementary point of view. And so instead of looking at the columns, uh, 
look at, at the rows of this matrix. Um, and so every, every row in this matrix is, is, is a neuron, and every neuron has a component over each of the vectors. Uh, and so then we can represent every neuron as a point in, in a new types of space now, which we call the connectivity space. And now this is a space where every axis is the entry over one of these vectors. So in this example, so the connectivity space would be five dimensional. And so here I'm showing you different two dimensional projections of this five dimensional space. And so every neuron is, is a point in this space. And then the whole network, the connectivity of the whole network can be represented in terms of a cloud of points, a distribution of, uh, of points in this, in, this, in this connectivity space. And now again, so this is really a cloud in, in five dimensions here, I'm showing you different, uh, different uh, projections. And the key point is that our mathematical theory predicts that the distribution of these of this, of this points in the connectivity space fully determines the, the latent dynamics. Um, okay, now this representation in the connectivity space, well, it looks very similar to this representation in selectivity space that I showed you at the beginning. In fact, while we can show that connectivity determines selectivity, so the distribution in, in connectivity space will the, 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 determine the distribution in selectivity space. So, so what we can do is now look at this distribution in connectivity space and apply the same kind of analysis that I showed you for, uh, for selectivity. Well, you basically ask, is there any structure in, in, in this distribution and, and, and does it play a role? Okay, so the next step is that we're going to redo the same type of an analysis that we did in selectivity space, but in the connectivity space. So how does this work? So this, here's again a cartoon of, 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 the, of the approach. So concretely, so for every, for every task, we start by training low rank networks to perform the same task. So, and this gives us networks that are um, well described in terms of these vectors o o o over neurons. So for every neuron, well, for every task, we can find the minimal rank and I'll come, come back to this. Uh, so then, th then we get a bunch of vectors, and for every neuron, we, we get a set of numbers which are the entries uh, on these connectivity vectors. And so then we can represent the connectivity in the, in the connectivity space, where every neuron now is, is a point, uh, and the whole network becomes, the connectivity of the whole network becomes a distribution in connectivity space. And again, I'm showing you only uh, two-dimensional projections here. And then we're going to apply the same analysis as before. So we're going to ask whether the structure of this distribution is, is different from a Gaussian or not. And so we're going to fit a Gaussian. And again, this Gaussian can have correlations and correlations are actually really, really important, but it, the Gaussian does not have additional structure else than, than correlations. So we fit the Gaussian in each case, and then we, we're going to ask to which extent the, the distribution of the train connectivity deviates from, 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 the, from the fitted Gaussian. So we can quantify the deviation between the distribution and, and the null model, which is a Gaussian. Um, okay, so now again, we can do this for each task and for every network trained on, on each of the tasks. And, and so now we get a picture uh, very similar to what we had in selectivity. So here, so, so here every, every, part, every dot represents the amount of deviation from a Gaussian but in connectivity this time. And so we, well, we get a picture that is very, very similar to, to what we had when we looked at selectivity. So we have three tasks in which the, the structure in connectivity, well, it seems to be well, well, well described by Gaussian. Well, we have two other tasks in which there seems to be, to, to be additional structure on, on, on top of the Gaussian. Okay, so this took us one step further. So we started from selectivity now I moved to connectivity and I showed you that there is some, some, some structure in, in, in connectivity, but this analysis still does not tell us whether the structure has a, a causal computational role or whether it's maybe some kind of artifact of the way that we trained uh, networks. So, so to understand uh, the computational role of the structure, so the next thing we did is to, to manipulate the connectivity and to, to see how manipulating the connectivity changes the computations. And more, more specifically, what, what we ask is whether scrambling this population structure that, 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 that appears here, whether it impacts the computations or not. And from this plot, we would predict that for these three tasks, 
So, so scrambling the, 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 well, the, the structure of the connectivity should not change the computations. Well, for these, the, the, these other two tasks, well, scrambling the, the structure should, should, should have an impact on, on, on computations. Okay, so, so, so how do we do this? So, so here's, a, again, a very similar cartoon illustrating the approach. So we start again from this trained low-rank low RNN. So the first step is exactly the same as before. So we represent the connectivity in the connectivity space. Then we fit the Gaussian distribution to, 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 to this distribution here. And now the next step is, so we want to scramble any structure that is not Gaussian. So what we're going to do is we're going to resample from the fitted distribution and generate new networks basically by sampling from the, from the fitted Gaussian distribution. So this gives us new networks which have the same Gaussian structure, in particular the same correlations as the original vectors, but all other non-Gaussian structure is scrambled, scrambled away. So we get new networks, and then we can run the same networks on the original tasks and, and ask how well they're doing the, um, the original tasks. Okay, and so for every network and for every task, we can do this. So we resample, we create new networks, and then we plot simply the performance on the original task. And, and this is what, what this plot is showing. And, and, and we see that for, for these first three tasks, well, the performance basically does not change if we just generate new networks by resampling. Well, for these two other tasks, well, the, the, the performance uh, drops uh, s s significantly. So scrambling the structure really impacts the, the, the computations. Okay, so at this point, let me, let me put everything together and, and make an interim summary. So we train RNNs on, on, on a range of tasks, and then we analyze this RNNs. And um, what we found is that for two of the tasks, uh, networks show the structure beyond the Gaussian in both selectivity and connectivity. And scrambling this structure, reshuffling this structure, this, this structure will strongly reduce the performance in these, two, in these two tasks, but not the other tasks. So this suggests that there's something special about these two tasks. They seem to require an additional amount of structure. So what is special about those the tasks? So these tasks are actually what we call flexible input-output tasks in the sense that an identical stimulus requires different outputs depending on the context. And so this is very explicit in, in this context-dependent decision-making task because the contextual cue determines what the output to this, uh, following the stimulus should be. But the delay match the sample has a very similar structure because the response to the second stimulus is actually determined by the previous stimulus. So the previous stimulus, in a sense, plays the role of a contextual cue. And so this, this result suggests that this flexible input task, output task might require a non-random population structure, but we can go further and try to understand what kind of structure this, this, this task need and, and, and why. Okay, so what I told you is that for these tasks, a Gaussian description of the connectivity in this connectivity space is, 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 is not, in, not enough. So we need to go beyond the Gaussian. And again, this, so that there are many ways of going beyond the Gaussian, but one natural approach is to try to, to cluster this kind of this, this, this distribution of points. So basically fit a mixture of, of, of Gaussians. Uh, so what this means is that, uh, well, we identify populations. So every neuron is assigned to, to one subpopulation and uh, within each subpopulation, the distribution is Gaussian, but the different subpopulations can have, in principle, different means and, and, and importantly, different correlations. And so this gives us a richer statistical description of the connectivity, and in particular, so this, this population structure and the number of populations so in this framework are, are, are independent of the rank. So, the, so they're really an extra level of, of, of structure. Okay, so now you can always do this, but the question is whether this gives this this is relevant at all. So the, the, is this a relevant description? And to answer this question, so we can follow the same approach as before. So basically, fit a mixture of Gaussian and then generate new networks by sampling from this this distribution, and then we can look whether these resample networks well well how well they do at the original task. And so we did this for these two flexible input output tasks. And so what I showed you is that if we fit a single Gaussian, well, the pop, the, and, and then resample for, 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 from it, so this is the, the, the performance drops quite a bit. But what we found is that if we, if we just fit a mixture of two Gaussians uh, and then resample from this richer distribution, uh, the, the performance recovers um, basically to, 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 to optimal levels. 
Okay, so now this shows that this mixture of Gaussian clustering is a useful approach for, for describing networks that perform this task. So this, this, so, 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 so this approach identifies subpopulations, and these subpopulations appear to have a functional role. But still, but we still wanted to understand what is the role. So what are the mechanisms? What, what are these populations actually doing? And to address this question, to understand the, the mechanisms, so we can go back to, to our theoretical framework that I very briefly uh, described a couple of slides ago. So what I told you is that for lower rank networks, we can fully understand the dynamics in the sense that we can reduce every lower rank network to an effective circuit, uh, which describes the latent dynamics and, uh, and gives us really a description of, of, of the computation. So the final output of, of our whole analysis of, of our whole study is that for each task, we can reduce networks trained on the task to equivalent effective circuits that, that embody the computations that at, at the latent level that the, the, comp that the networks are, are performing. So more specifically, so the way this works is that for each task, we look for the minimal rank needed to, to perform the task, and the rank tells us how many latent variables we need. So the, 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 so, so the rank basically determines the number of nodes in this effective circuit. Uh, so that's the first step. And then we can identify the num minimal number of populations that we need, and we can fit a, a Gaussian distribution for each of the population, and this connectivity structure determines, in fact, the interactions, the edges in, in this equivalent circuit. Okay, so for every task, we get an equivalent circuit, and some of those are not really uh, surprising at all. So for example, for, for, for this classical uh, random dot task, what we get is, is a circuit that re represents uh, ju just, a, just an integrator. So the latent variable here is just integrated evi evidence. Uh, we, we, it has some positive feedback, which leads to long time scales and, and in, in, in integrates inputs. Now for these more complicated tasks, in particular this flexible into output tasks, so what the results we got were, were, less, were less expected, at least to us. So we realized that actually this task can be performed with rather low rank, but in both cases, so the networks needed at least two populations. And so why is this the case? Well, the, the key underlying insight is that having more than one population co confers extra uh, flexibility at the level of the interactions between the latent variables and, and the inputs. And I, I'm going to uh, now very briefly illustrate this in, in, on this context-dependent decision-making task about which we, we heard already, already a lot from, 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 from Tatiana's lab. Uh, so we found that rank one is enough here. So we have one latent variable, and this latent variable represents integrated evidence. Uh, but this latent variable so selectively integrates either one of the or the other stimulus depending on the context. And well, the subpopulations basically play a key role in gating which, um, which stimulus gets, gets, uh, gets integrated. And so the way this works is that, so we have two populations in the network, which I'm illustrating here in two different colors. And um, so as I said, each population controls which uh, feature is integrated. And the key point is that the gains of the two populations can be varied separately. And so what, so what happens here is that contextual inputs flexibly modulate the gains of the two population in, in an opposite manner between the two contexts. And this is why we need two, two populations, because we need an opposite um, 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 modulation. So, it, so, so the contextual inputs basically shift the position of the two pop populations mm -hmm. on the input output uh, curve, which in this case is, is just um, is a, a hyperbolic tangent. And, and, and so this gain modulation basically modulates the effective strength of the inputs to the, to, to, to the latent variable. So, so what happens here is that, in fact, so by reverse engineering, analyzing network strain on this context-dependent task, so we, we recover this classical uh, mechanism of selective integration by gain modulation, but in in a network that is highly mixed selective um, with, with populations that are really very noisy, very fuzzy, so that they're difficult to, uh, to just see, see by eye. Now, our, what our approach does so, is that it, it identifies populations from, from the connectivity, and then it makes predictions, for, for example, for inactivations, uh, and it basically predicts that inactivating one or the other population 
uh, has very specific effects. Uh, and so this is, this is illustrated here. So every square here is a psychometric matrix. So the two axes are the, well, the strength of the two inputs, so, so motion and color. And the black and white colors here basically show the responses for each combination of stimuli. And so this is a full network. And we see that it does the context-dependent task. So in one context, it integrates, well, it, it, it decides the function of input A. In the other context, it decides the function of input B. And now in activating population B, for example, uh, well, it removes the output, the, the, this context-dependent behavior. So we see that uh, the network actually only integrates input A. And oppositely, if we inactivate the other population, the, the network integrates only, uh, 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 only input B. Okay, so this, is, um, so this is the kind of predictions that we can test, uh, well, also in full rank networks, so in any network, and, and, and perhaps uh, one day in, in the experiments. Okay, so, so this point, uh, I'm going to, to zoom out and, and, and summarize uh, everything I told you. So I, I started from this apparent dichotomy between two types of approaches for understanding computation. So the approach based on collective dynamics and the approach based on sorting neurons into classes. And more specifically, I, I focused on, on an extended concept of functional subpopulations, functional cell classes that takes into account mixed selectivity. And the key question that of, of the talk was whether from the point of view of collective dynamics we ever need to think in terms of subpopulations or cell classes to understand computations. And so what I showed you, what I tried to, 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 to convey here is that analyzing network models really makes clear that this apparent dichotomy is a false one because fundamentally both the collective dynamics and the selectivity are determined by the underlying connectivity. And the organization in, in subpopulation is a particular type of structure that the connectivity can have. And so really our key insight, our key result is that for specific computations, implementing suitable collective dynamics, in fact, requires this type of subpopulation structure and the connectivity, which then may be reflected at the level of uh, uh, functional, uh, functional selectivity. So do we need to think in terms of cell classes? Well, the answer is yes, but we need to think in terms of cell classes at the level of connectivity. Uh, so to finish, I'd like to, to thank all the fantastic people I have been lucky to work with. So first and foremost, uh, the, the, the team who, who did the work I presented today, um, then the, the, the current members of my lab, the former Lambels members of the lab, and the, the many collaborators uh, I have been uh, lucky to interact with. And uh, finally, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sergeant. Time for just a couple of questions. Hi. <clears throat> that was very elegant work. Thank you for that talk. Um, I had two questions. I'll try and be quick. So the first is, um, does the minimum rank of the network or the number of populations required? I, I'm sorry. I can't hear very well. Uh... <clears throat> Hello. I was asking if the minimum rank of the network or the number of populations required will depend on what it is about the behavior that you ask your network to explain. Right, so you could only explain choice or choice and reaction time or those plus sequential dependencies and so forth. And so does, you know, the task isn't sufficient to define the network perhaps? So absolutely, the first step here is that we define a task. And so mm. that defines what we want to capture. So typically here we want to capture only choice. So we didn't look at reaction times. And right. depending on, on the, the relationship between inputs and, and the choice output that we want to capture, so that we'll, we, we will get different rank and different number of populations. Right. Okay, great. The other question quickly is, um, since you talked about the necessity of cell classes, it always raises the question of, um, are there natural kinds, are there discrete classes, or um, can, is there a computational necessity of the classes being discrete rather than having a continuum along some computational dimension? Yeah, so this, this dichotomy into discrete and, and, and continuous, for me, it's not a very clear one. Of course, if you had zero noise, then you have discrete. Uh, but as, as soon as you, as you have noise, I mean, the things are, are a bit blurry. So, so that's why we use this approach where we fit a mixture model, which is a noisy, it, 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 it identifies noisy classes. And then the question is whether these are relevant or not. And that's why we resample from this distribution to check the performance, because this is the only way we can make sure that the classes that we identify 
actually have a role. So I hope this 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 addresses the question. So so then if you have if you fit only one class and it, the performance drops, that means that we need more than one. Okay. Hi, thanks for this illuminating talk. I, I want to play devil's advocate for a second. So you did this huge detour to get back to a model that was already suggested in the 90s, right? This is what I understood. So I want to sort of, if you can clarify, what did we learn on the way through this detour? I'm sorry, I didn't get the detour. You'll have to explain it to me. You, you, at the end, you, you got to a model that was already suggested in a very old paper, right? Which model is that? At the end, for this, for the last experiment, you said you had a model that already oh, oh, that contained model, all the elements. Sorry, yes. So, <laughs> well, what we what we get is that we extract this model from trained networks. So we didn't start. We didn't guess this model. This is the result of an of an analysis. And and by the way, so what we get is an extended version of this model where this, the populations are really mixed mix selective. And the relevant stimulus is actually represented in both contexts. So both, uh, uh, so for example, motion is represented in both the color context and, and the motion context, which is not present in the original model. So, so basically we're just showing that this old model is in fact consistent with the neural mechanisms that were identified by Valeria Mantedevich. So I hope this answers the question. Thanks. Let's thank Sergin again for this beautiful talk. The next presentation is by Anki Kumar from the University of California, Berkeley. Okay, uh, hi everyone, my name is Ankit. Um, so I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley and I work with Chris Bouchard up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, so first I'd like to thank the organizers of COSINE uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's a really great honor. So today I'm gonna to be talking about feedback controllability as a normative principle of neural dynamics. So kind of modern neural data sets uh, recorded during naturalistic behaviors are high dimensional and they feature complex dynamics. So here I'm just showing uh, two examples from a, a macaque doing a self-paced reaching task or a rodent navigating a maze and sort of the associated neural activity that's recorded during the tax, task execution. So widespread observation uh, about these dynamics is that despite their high dimensionality, often the task relevant or behaviorally relevant components of the dynamics is confined to a lower dimensional subspace. So here I'm taking a figure from Scout and Ganguly showing that if you take a fraction of variance explained as your measure of dimensionality, then across a range of sort of experimentally recorded data sets, then uh, the number of dimensions needed to explain a significant fraction of variance is much fewer than the number of recorded units. So this has motivated the development of a lot of dimensionality reduction techniques in order to kind of extract this behaviorally or task relevant subspace from the data in sort of a supervised fashion. We've heard about some of them um, at this year's COSINE as well. However, uh, I would say we still lack the ability to predict from first principles the features or properties that the dynamics within these task relevant subspaces should have in order to facilitate function. So in other words, we lack a normative approach towards dimensionality reduction. And it's sort of the goal of this work to help bridge this gap. So uh, in search of uh, sort of a normative principle for neural dynamics, we're gonna take a control theoretic uh, approach to the problem. And you know, if the prevailing sort of view is that a neural population, a neural circuit can be represented as some dynamical system, then I think a natural question to ask is how, what are different ways one can sort of control this system? And so in control theory, there are basically two paradigms here. And one of them is what we're gonna call feed forward, which is basically open loop control, where you have system inputs that uh, drive activity within, within the dynamical system, and then they're read out uh, at some downstream output. And that's sort of all there is to it. And in contrast, we have sort of feedback or closed loop control, where you have system inputs that excite the system, but sort of uh, at the sort of output, um, there's actually a feedback controller that takes observations uh, of the activity and then synthesizes some regulation signal that's reintroduced into the system. Um, and sort of the signal might be used to maintain homeostasis in the system to correct the effects of noise or some otherwise suboptimal um, input. Now, a closely related uh, but sort of distinct concept from control is that of controllability. Uh, and this is a measure of how amenable a dynamical system is uh, to being controlled. And so the key point um, I, wanna, uh, I wanna make here is that uh, this is an intrinsic measure associated with the system dynamics that gives insight into how its structure um, could possibly map onto function. So again, we can separate controllability uh, into these two classes and one of them being feed forward 
or open loop controllability, which is essentially asking how much energy do I need to put into these system inputs in order to drive a certain level of uh, variance or to drive the state space of this dynamical system uh, through a certain volume. And on the other hand, uh, we can think about uh, feedback or closed loop controllability, which is essentially asking how well can a feedback controller take the observed dynamics and use partial observations in order to synthesize a regulation signal. So first observation one can make, right, is that feedback is ubiquitous across spatial temporal scales in the nervous system. And so this is true at the level of behavior where there's a constant feedback loop between action and sensory perceptions oops, of, of those actions. It's true at the level of uh, intercortical communication where there are lots of feedback loops uh, or feedback connections between different cortical areas. And it's true at the level of the local uh, canonical microcircuit uh, where you have lots of feedback connections um, both between and uh, within layers. And so this fact motivates us to hypothesize that the neural dynamics associated uh, with these structures should be amenable to control under feedback. So in other words, they should be feedback controllable. So another kind of uh, fact about uh, the organization of the nervous system is that Dale's law constrains every uh, synapse uh, coming out of a neuron to be either excitatory or inhibitory, right? So that, that means is when you look at the synaptic connectivity matrix of some population of neurons, um, every sort of synapse coming out of, or every connection coming out of an excitatory neuron is going to be sign constrained to be positive, whereas every connection coming out of an inhibitory neuron is going to be sign constrained uh, to be negative. And the sort of corresponding constraint on the block structure of the synaptic connectivity matrix uh, means that this matrix will be non-normal. And one way to sort of formalize that statement is to say that uh, W, which is the connectivity matrix here, uh, WW transpose is not going to equal W transpose W. And it's known that this fact of non-normality has dramatic consequences for the dynamics that can unfold over these networks. And what I'm going to show in this talk is that it also has kind of dramatic consequences for the controllability of the dynamics that unfold over these networks. So, you know, if we think about the firing rates of uh, some uh, population of neurons as tracing out a trajectory in this neural state space, uh, where sort of the uh, axes are spanned by the activity of each single neuron, our goal is going to be to identify subspaces of this high dimensional neural state space that differ with respect to their controllability properties. So we're gonna consider the feed forward controllable subspace here to be one in which a normalized input can drive the system state uh, to uh, a, a great, the, the greatest volume possible uh, sort of within the subspace, and that's kind of indicated in the schematic here, where you see the dynamics within the feedforward controllable subspace contain a large amplification, uh, kind of both of possibly signal and noise. And in contrast, we're going to think about the feedback controllable subspace uh, as one in which um, one can take dynamics that lie within this feedback controllable subspace and use them uh, to do uh, the this, this kind of canonical functional stages of a feedback controller, right? So the first is to reconstruct the original neural state trajectory via some state filtering um, step. And the other one is to synthesize some state regulation signal that this, that's then reintroduced into the feedback controllable subspace, right? So in other words, the feedback controllable um, subspace should be one in which I can use the dynamics that lie here in order to most effectively synthesize uh, some feedback control policy. Now, uh, one thing you can see that I've indicated here is that there's some finite angle between these two subspaces, right? So this, this theta here. So indicating that kind of in general, one might expect that sort of the most feed forward versus the most feedback controllable dynamics will actually lie in subspaces that are geometrically distinct from each other. So the first question one can ask is when is this gonna be true? So to answer this question, we kind of go back to this idea of non-normality. So we just simulated large numbers of kind of synthetic linear dynamical systems uh, in which we can sort of measure the average angle between feed forward and feedback uh, controllability as a function of some scalar measure of the non-normality of the underlying dynamics matrix. And what you can see is that uh, when the system is close to normal, these subspace angles are very small, whereas as you increase the non-normality, these subspace angles go to pi over two, which indicates that in a very non-normal system, sort of the dynamics that are most feed forward or open loop controllable are going to actually lie in a space that is orthogonal to the dynamics that are most feedback controllable. Um, and so this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of begs the question, how are we actually measuring these quantities, right? So we're gonna take as an implicit model of the data, just a sort of linear dynamical system. So here X of T is going to be the neural firing rates um, and they're going to evolve according to some linear dynamical system that's driven by stochastic input. And we're going to think about activity within a subspace as being sort of some linear projection of the observed neural firing rates. 
matrices, right? So y of t equals c x of t, where c is some projection matrix that reduces the dimensionality of the system. So you can think about this as sort of your canonical observation matrix in a state space model, but here it's being applied to the observed neural firing rates. So again, our interest is controllability. So how amenable is the system or the neural population to control now for different choices of this C matrix? And so how, you know, the way we measure this feed forward controllability is going to be the log determinant of a C pi C transpose. So this is the projection of the neural state covariance and kind of the control theoretic interpretation of what this quantity is measuring is the volume of state space that's accessible by some normalized uh, unit norm input. And feedback controllability, we're going to measure uh, by using the trace of P times Q, which is going to uh, basically measure the combined cost of filtering and regulation. And so here P is the state filtering or Kalman filter error covariance associated with estimation of this X of T given observations Y of T. And Q here is sort of the state regulation uh, cost gramian, uh, kind of associated with just here linear quadratic regulations as kind of a a standard uh, sort of feedback controller of uh, sort of regulation of X of T, again, given observations uh, Y of T. Um, and so there's a Wells kind of motivated theoretical reason for thinking about the trace of the product of these two quantities. I'm happy to talk about that uh, in more detail offline. Um, but the point is we're gonna use each of these objective functions as the basis of a dimensionality reduction method. So we're going to essentially optimize this C matrix uh, in order to, in, you know, in one case maximize this quantity and in the other case to minimize this quantity. And so one thing you can keep in the back of your head is that under the kind of assumption that your dynamics are generated by a linear dynamical system, then what feed forward controllability is doing is essentially what PCA is doing, right? It's just picking out directions of high variance uh, in the observed space. Um, and so for this feedback controllability metric, uh, we've de developed a means of estimating these P and Q matrices from the second order statistics of the data. Um, so here P is estimated using the fact that the Kalman filter is kind of your minimum mean squared error estimate um, of your neural state given observations. And we estimate Q uh, actually by using the duality between regulation and filtering. So we can actually ma uh, map this state regulation problem to a filtering problem. Okay, so then uh, let's kind of use these tools and uh, take a look at some neural data. So we're gonna focus our analysis on a particular data set from the Sabies lab that contains co-recordings from M1 and S1 as the monkey's performing a self-paced reaching task. Uh, and so the first thing we did was you just fit linear dynamical system models to these data sets uh, and found the corresponding A matrices to be kind of strongly non-normal. And of course there's prior work showing that motor cortex in particular should operate in this kind of non-normal regime. And correspondingly, we find the subspace angle between the feed forward and feedback controllable subspaces to be quite high. So here about three pi over eight, where the spread is taken across recording sessions. And we found similar effects in SMAT sensory cortex. And so our key hypothesis, right, is that feedback controllability is really capturing a, sort, of a, is sort of a normative principle of functionally relevant dynamics. And so if this were to be true, then sort of projecting onto the feedback controllable subspace should give rise to better decoding of behavior than projecting onto the feed forward controllable subspace. So to test this hypothesis, we just built simple linear decoders off the basis of activity projected onto these sort of feed forward versus feedback controllable dynamics. We find is that across the full range of uh, projection dimensions, uh, we get better uh, decoding of the, of the, of the monkey's vo uh, hand velocity from feedback controllable dynamics as opposed to feed forward controllable dynamics. And this is true both, both on average across recording sessions and individually within each recording session. So here in this inset, I'm just showing the uh, sort of area under each of these decoding curves uh, sort of compared pairwise across recording sessions. And if you take the difference between these two curves, you get sort of a delta velocity prediction R squared that reaches its shoulder at about dimension six, which is roughly the number of relevant uh, kinematic variables. And kind of the key thing to note here is that uh, this, this peak difference represents about a 45% increase uh, in behavioral decoding. Uh, and this is despite the fact that both of these me methods are totally within the same kind of class of methods, right? I'm just taking different linear projections of the data that I found by optimizing different control theoretic objectives. And again, we see sort of similar effects in somatosensory cortex. So the kind of the next question we uh, took a look at is we investigated the properties of the actual single units that are involved in these projections. So it's possible to uh, calculate the importance of a single unit uh, in these different projections or kind of observations of the observed system by just taking the norm of the corresponding row of the projection matrix. 
Um, and so here I've plotted those important scores on sort of a log log plot. And the first thing you can notice is that these uh, important scores are totally un uh, uncorrelated from each other. So a Spearman rank correlation of about 0.02. So this kind of means is that if you take a look at the neurons that are participating in this feedback controllable subspace indicated here in red that have sort of high importance score, they form a sort of a distinct population from the neurons that are participating in this feed forward controllable subspace that are indicated here in black. If you then sort of take a look at the uh, sort of trial average firing rates of these single units, which I've sort of plotted here, you can see that they're um, sort of uh, have very different single unit dynamics, right? So the, this population in black seems to have various stereotyped responses that sort of have high kind of amplification and, and kind of turn on uh, at the time of reach initiation, whereas these feedback controllable dynamics have more um, heterogeneous kind of ongoing uh, firing rate traces. And one can quantify this sort of by, you know, calculating uh, various statistics of the cross correlations between these um, firing rate traces and sort of points to the fact that, you know, these feedback and feed forward controllable subspaces are actually recruiting distinguishable populations of neurons. Kind of the next thing we wanted to uh, take a look at is this presence, this noted presence of uh, rotational dynamics within uh, M1. And so uh, if one uh, sort of projects uh, us using JPCA, uh, onto the feedback versus feed forward controllable subspaces, we find uh, sort of more stereotyped rotational dynamics within the feedback controllable subspace. And we can quantify this using the sum of the imaginary eigenvalues uh, within the JPCA fits and finding a statistically significant difference. And so we decided to take a closer look at this and did some numerics and analytics. And we sort of essentially found that in tractable low dimensional models, um, the feedback controllability is extremized by purely rotational dynamics. Um, and so uh, we also took a look at sort of uh, communication between M1 and S1, just to quickly uh, give you the, the details. We just did canonical correlation analysis to try to identify whether communication between these two regions interacted differently between feed forward versus feedback controllable dynamics. Sort of two key points is that you get very good predictability of activity within the feedback controllable subspace from the M1 canonical correlate subspace, despite the fact that the subspace angles between all of these spaces are distinct, right? So you have three distinct functional subspaces, um, but sort of the, the canonical correlate or the communication subspace seems to be projecting onto the M1 feedback controllable subspace. So to wrap up, we devised a means of measuring feedback controllability from the second order statistics of an observed dynamical system. This gives rise to a dimensionality reduction method that does not attempt to maximize variance captured or reconstruct data we found that the non-normality of the underlying linear dynamical system introduces a divergence between these subspaces and the single units that participate in these subspaces. And we get, um, we, we can sort of explain multiple features of observed neural data uh, under this framework. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Ankit. We have time for one question while the next speaker is setting up. Uh, hello. I wanted to see if we can, I know that it's hard to do it in non-human primates, but is it possible to correlate these different cell, cell populations to different layers in the cortex? Because it might be just layer four is getting like maybe input, and it's like mostly fit forward. And Yeah, and I think a, that's a great question. Um, and so uh, with this particular data set, I don't think we have sort of good good spatial localization of the single units, but I think uh, doing this analysis and other data sets where one can actually yeah, try to resolve uh, you know, layers, cell types, uh, you know, different electrophysiological uh, properties of the actual um, single neurons that are participating in these different subspaces, uh, yeah, I think that's a really important direction to go into. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have time for one more question? So. Thanks for the talk. A couple of related quick questions. Um, you motivated feedback controllability very nicely, but I didn't get why you were trying to avoid feed forward controllability. And second, you originally started out motivating feedback controllability through dimensionality reduction, but it wasn't clear why the feedback controllable subspaces needed to be low dimensional. Maybe that reflects the task or the need to avoid overfitting. So can you comment on those, please? Yeah, no, I think. Um... Right, two points there. I think in general, uh, you know, there might be certain tasks or areas in which sort of uh, feed forward controllability is important. We just think that maybe given the structure of the nervous system and the fact that feedback is so important that sort of overall uh, feedback controllability might be the be better normative measure. Um, and you're right, so we, we use it as a dimensionality reduction method in order to sort of compress the observed um, neural, spa uh, neural state space. Um, and what I didn't show is that actually you kind of get a saturation of the feedback 
total feedback controllability at low dimensions. So it does seem like there's kind of a low dimensional dynamical system that can capture most of those properties. Um, but also by doing the dimensionality reduction method, you're also able to pick out which neurons are most um, important. So it's one way of getting at kind of the importance of single neurons by trying to compress things and keep track of which neurons participate strongly. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank Ankit uh, again. The next speaker is Alexander van Megan from Harvard University. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for coming after, after the party. I'm really excited to, to present my work here. And yeah, I'm now a postdoc at the Zumpelinski lab in Harvard, but I'd like to point out that the work I'm reporting on today was done in Jülich at Moritz Helia's lab. So we all know that recurrent networks operate in time, and so a natural perspective is to look at them as dynamical systems. And here the core notion is the state space, so very simply we put the activity of each neuron on each axis, and then the kind of time evolution of the entire system makes such a trajectory through state space. Now the kind of canonical next step in analyzing the state space is to look for the simple most structure in the state space, namely the fixed points, the points where the dynamics cease to evolve further. There's an important distinction between fixed points. There are stable and unstable fixed points. And so in this example here, you would see the network evolving towards an unstable fixed point, being repelled along an unstable direction, and eventually move into a stable fixed point. Now, although kind of the, the fixed points are the simple most structure we could look for, they can give rise to a deep understanding of both the dynamics and even the computation of the system. And to drive this point home, I'd like to resort back to a beautiful example from the opening the black box paper by uh, David Cicillo and Omri Barak, where they trained a recurrent network on a three-bit flip-flop task that you see on the left. And here the catch is really that the network needs to remember them without interference between these inputs. And on the right, you see a low dimensional projection of the state space. You see eight stable fixed points corresponding to the eight different memory states of the system. And then green, unstable fixed points in between mediating the transitions between these fixed points. And I think this is a beautiful example showing how analyzing the state space and analyzing fixed points can give rise to an understanding of the system. However, here we have a rather low dimensional system or low dimensional dynamics and an effective low dimensional structure in state space. So what we wonder now is what happens if the dimensionality of the activity is high and yeah, can we then still understand something about the underlying state space. So to this end, we considered random recurrent neural networks. More concretely, we considered the model proposed by Zompolinski, Kizanti, and Sommers, where the single neurons simply undergo an exponential relaxation to some baseline state if there's no recurrent input. The recurrent input is mediated by some nonlinear transfer function phi, will be a hyperbolic tangent for concreteness here. And the most important part is the connectivity matrix, which will be assumed to be independent, identically distributed Gaussian. Now, the key control parameter here is the strength of this um, connectivity matrix. The randomness in the connectivity really unlocks the door to a deep theoretical understanding of the dynamics here. And the key tool is dynamical field theory, developed in the seminal paper by Heim Polinski, Andrea Crisanti, and Hans Jürgen Sommers. And it, the observable one can compute is the temporal autocorrelation of the system. And one of the key insights here is that as you increase the strength of the connection, the, the network undergoes a sharp transition from a quiescent state to a chaotic state with ongoing fluctuation driven very high dimensional activity. And now this work really was a stepping stone and there's a lot of beautiful examples by many of you here in the room extending and deepening the understanding of such systems and in particular of the activity of such systems. However, in contrast, I'd like to argue that the state space, in particular the fixed points, received considerably less attention. There's an early result by Weinrib and Tubul from 2013, who showed that slightly above this critical connection strength, the state space features an exponential number of fixed points, of unstable fixed points. And now at the heart of my talk today, of our work, was the very, very simple question, where are those fixed points in state space. Now, in principle, this poses 
even computationally challenging system, uh, uh, challenging problem to just find the fixed points for a high dimensional recurrent network. Now, in this case, the, the problem somewhat simplifies a bit because we have random networks, so the problem simplifies to the distribution of fixed points in state space. And here we built on, on the work by Tubul and Van Rip and employed the Cartwright formalism, mapped the problem to a random matrix problem that we can solve analytically, and obtained the full n-dimensional distribution of fixed points in state space. However, this is still a rather hard to visualize quantity, and so we go one step further and compute the distribution of the entries of the fixed points. Now, we can compare this, of course, to uh, fixed points that we find numerically for a given realization. And here in, in this plot, I'm really just putting each coordinate of each fixed point into this histogram. And you see that the analytical theory very nicely matches the shape of the distribution. Already here, I'd like to point out that at least to leading order, the dynamics will give rise to a Gaussian distribution. And here we see a very strongly non-Gaussian effect in the fixed points. Now, computing the, the distribution is really the key theoretical result of our work. Um, so let's move on a step further and analyze what we see. So the first natural question is to ask what happens if you increase the strength of the connections. And here we see that with increasing strength of the connection, a sharper and sharper peak arises in combination with a broad base in this distribution. So what does this mean? It means that at the fixed points, a lot of coordinates are zero or close to zero, and there's a broad base of the remaining coordinates that span the space. So put differently, the fixed points, they lie in the subsets of the space of a few neurons. So for example, here of these, these two neurons. In particular, this also means that the distribution of fixed points in contrast to the dynamics is non-isotropic in, in state space. Now, the next question is, of course, to compare the fixed points to the dynamics. Now, again, we chose the kind of simple most measure we can look for, namely the distance to the origin in state space. For the dynamics, we can compute this from the zero-leg autocorrelation that can be obtained from dynamical mean field theory, so we can obtain this analytically. For the fixed points, we can also get this, this uh, radial separation from the distribution of fixed points that we computed. And now, as you see in the bottom, as we increase the strength of the recurrent interaction, the two separate more and more. So allow me to put this into a simple sketch where we have two spheres given by a certain fixed radius to the origin, and we have this sphere of fixed points that lie inside the sphere of the dynamics, but I also like to point out that this really is a sketch because it's, in particular for the fixed points, it's non-isotropic. So at this point, let me take a step back because I think here we really achieved a more kind of global understanding of the system. So dynamical mean field theory gives rise to a deep understanding of the dynamics. And here now we can complement this with the, yeah, the structure of the state space, with the distribution of fixed points in state space. Of course, we can, having the fixed points, we can go one step further and look at the linearized dynamics. And I also, I only want to, to point out this quickly, so we can linearize the dynamics, look at the local properties of the dynamics at the fixed points, which are encoded in, in the Jacobian, and so we can get the Jacobian, the eigenvalue of the Jacobian, their radius, their radial distribution, and analyze, or, this gives rise then to, to further possibility to analyze the dynamics. So with this, let me take a step back and summarize. So the main theoretic contri theoretical contribution is that we analytically calculated the distribution of fixed points in state space for canonical random recurrent neural network model. We saw first that these fixed points are non-isotropic in straight space, that they are located in the span of the subset of the axis. And we found a dra rather drastic separation between the dynamics and the fixed points in state space, namely this radial separations onto the different shells. We also have the tools to, to analyze further, to look at the Jacobian. We can get the eigenvalues of the Jacobian, the corresponding eigenvalue radius, and the, the radial distribution. Now, before concluding, I'd like to speculate and highlight why I think analyzing random networks is still a very interesting problem. So first of all, 
we see this exponential number of fixed points kind of poses a structural backbone for sequence processing. So what we see in the dynamics is that the trajectories evolve along these fixed points, and so you can think about them as symbolic dynamics where each fixed point corresponds to a different point in the sequence. Of course, it's a very open question how to leverage this structure that's there in the space, state space for actual computations. Um, a second thing, point that I think is interesting is to see how, or typically we initialize networks randomly when we train them. And I think it would be very interesting to see how this structure of fixed points that we revealed here now evolves towards, for example, this very beautiful structure that we saw in the be beginning from the opening the black box paper. More generally, I'd like to point out that here we have a nonlinear chaotic, high-dimensional nonlinear chaotic system where we get a rare glimpse into the, the states or underlying state space of the system. Um, I'd like to take the last minute to thank the team because this really was a team effort with enormous contributions from all of us, although I have the pleasure now to, to stand here and to present it. There's Jakob Stubenrauch, Christian Kolb, Anno Kurt, and Moritz Helias. In particular, I'd like to highlight the role of Jakob, who really did all the hard work, who did the simulations, who made the numerics work. And for the details, I'd like to refer you to our preprint and archive. And I thank the funding, and I thank all of you for being here and for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, uh, of course, this is a random network, and there's no temperature or no noise in the network, but it probably will be very sensitive to this. Did you have a look at that? So I did not tell you the full story. So we did include in the computation kind of constant in time, but distributed external input that you can still include in the com computation and um, derive like how this changes the, the fixed points. Um, having noise, external noise driving the system per se, doesn't alter the structure of spa state space, right? It will just alter the dynamics resulting. Does this address the question? Well, it's more like in the connectivity when, uh, so the, it means that the network structure slightly changes and uh, uh, so these unstable states could be, you know, you kick, kick things out there easily, so therefore I was wondering yes. it should actually change. Yeah, I think what the system really does is to hop from one of these fixed points to another, but we don't really have a good way to quantify this. Sorry, we should uh, wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Luke Campagnolo from the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Hello, I'm Luke. Um, I'm a scientist at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Um, I just want to start out by saying that uh, these people I get to work with are fantastic, and I am, I'm so honored to be here speaking for them. Uh, they're such a joy to work with. Um, I'm going to tell you about a project that we've worked on for several years that asks, what is the relationship between cell types in the cortex and the behavior of individual synapses. Um, this project is part of a much broader mission to define and characterize the cell types and connections that make up our brains. Um, and there's been a whole lot of debate about what we actually mean when we say cell types. But my favorite explanation is that cell types are just a framework for understanding the brain. They're a way of taking our billions of neurons and reducing them down to a more manageable set of, of objects. Um, cell types are a simplified description of the brain that's built from the available biological data, that's all. Um, so where each type has rules that define its behavior, um, uh, which cell types it connects to, and uh, how the types signal to each other. So when we look at just a single cortical region, we count anywhere from tens to hundreds of cell types. Um, and I know this looks like a lot, but our bodies go to extraordinary lengths to ensure that the structures uh, and the circuits in our brains develop according to this plan. So I take the viewpoint that these details are probably important just because it's so costly to build them in the first place. 
Um, good news, though, um, I'm not going to tell you today that you need to worry about all of these cell types. We're going to focus on just a few broad groups of cells, but I am going to tell you that you need to worry about all the messy details of these synapses that we've been characterizing. So let's look closer. We've got an axon terminal synapsing onto a dendrite, and this synapse can release neurotransmitter from multiple release sites. Um, and when a spike arrives at the terminal, each of these sites may or may not release a vesicle with some random probability. So in this example, only two of the three release sites actually release vesicles. Uh, these vesicles carry neurotransmitter, which results in an electrical signal in the postsynaptic cell. OK, so already some things we might want to measure here. Um, we can look at, for example, the amplitude of this response. These are small, usually less than half of a millivolt in the synapses that we're looking at. Uh, we can look at the latency from the spike to the response. We can look at the rise in the decay kinetics. Um, but because this vesicle, this, uh, the vesicle release is stochastic, for every spike, we get a different random number of vesicle released, and that's, and that's a different amplitude of signal every time. And the variance of these responses is usually large enough that we might expect this to really impact the way the network behaves. So this is another parameter that we're interested in measuring for our synapses. Um, and there's one more effect that we want to think about, which is that the probability of a vesicle being released can change based on the recent history of spiking. Um, so for example, if we have a rapid train of spikes, depending on the synapse, we may see the response amplitudes facilitate, or they may depress, um, or some combination of these two. So we have several different parameters that we can measure in order to characterize a single synapse. Um, and it's important to remember that all of these parameters are cell type dependent, which means that all of the synapses in a circuit like this are behaving in different ways. Um, and in particular, they're dynamic machines, which means we shouldn't think about circuit diagrams like these as having fixed weights, right? The circuit can effectively rewire itself from moment to moment based on the previous history of activity. OK, so let's talk briefly about how we measure these properties in the context of cell types. Um, our tool of choice here is patch clamp. And we're going to start with a slice of living brain tissue. Um, this is either from a human surgical explant or uh, from a transgenic mouse that fluorescently labels um, different kinds of cells. So when we put this tissue under the microscope, we can pick out individual cells. In a mouse experiment, we have fluorescent re reporters that mark two different cell subclasses. So for example, uh, let's say the blue cell here is a layer 5 TLX3 pyramidal cell, and the red cell is a parvalbumin interneuron. At this point, we have no idea if these cells are connected by a synapse. Um, so we're going to attach patch electrodes to each of these two cells, and we'll stimulate one cell to fire a series of spikes. Um, and we're going to watch for a synaptic response in the other cell. And if we, end, uh, if we do this with eight electrodes at the same time, then by stimulating each cell one at a time and recording on all of the others, we can test for up to 56 possible connections in a single experiment. Um, each cell will fire several hundred spikes over the course of an experiment, and we're going to vary the timing between the spikes in order to uh, test the behavior of the synapses under different conditions. So that's one experiment. Um, if we run many hundreds of these experiments on many slices of tissue, um, we can compute some population statistics, like, uh, for example, how often did we see a connection between each pair of cell types? So we're currently looking at all of our mouse data, it spans from, from layer 2, 3 to layer 6. And we hit uh, one or two pyramidal types per layer and three different interneuron types. That's PV, SST, and VIP. Um, so for example, we can see that parvalbumin interneurons in layer 2, 3 are very likely to connect to nearby pyramidal cells, um, but not VIP cells. So our data mostly samples connections between cells that are in the same cortical layer. Um, a lot of this is verification of things that we've seen in the past, but we also had some surprises. Um, so for example, we see that in every layer, uh, we have connections between somatostatin and neurons. Um, and this is generally treated in the literature as if they're not connected to one another. Um, but we find that their connectivity is actually not much different from the rate of connections between pyramidal cells, for example. Um, I should also point out that there are many different experimental factors that can affect the rates of connectivity we see here, and we spend a lot of space in our manuscript that came out last year um, quantifying these effects and trying to estimate corrections for them. 
Um, data and results are all published. They're downloadable. Um, there's a website with more information, um, and, and there'll be a link to that at the, at the end. Um, OK, moving on. So we can also collapse the layers and look at the average properties of broad cell classes. So for example, here we're looking at a measure of synaptic strength between pyramidal cells and the three major inhibitory groups. Um, and there's some interesting details here, too, like uh, that the SST and the VIP populations are strongly mutually inhibitory, right? And in fact, the SST to VIP connections appear to be the strongest inhibitory connections in our whole data set. Um, and likewise, the strongest excitatory connections we found were also onto VIP cells. And like so many other details that we see in the data, um, this connection is often totally overlooked in the computational and the systems literature. Um, and I've been watching, and uh, it's also overlooked by the authors of several cosine posters. Um, yes, I have been watching. You, you know who you are. Um, the, the strongest in inhibitory connection in, this, in the cortex, right? Um, nobody seems to want it in their model. Uh, so anyway, to be fair, these connections are, are pretty sparse, but we find that when they are present, they tend to be very strong. Um, okay. These are all static pictures of the circuit. Um, and one of the most interesting things about synapses that really shines in this data set is that they're so dynamic in their strength. So going back to variance, if we were to look at the distribution of amplitudes that we see for a single synapse, um, we can then make a simple model of synaptic vesicle release. And we can ask, what are likely values for the number of release sites and the release probability that best explain the data that we recorded? Um, and so we optimize parameters for this model. And when we compare these parameters across experiments, we find that the amount of variance depends strongly on the cell types involved, which leads us to wonder whether variance itself is part of the architecture of this circuit, right? Is it possible that there's some computational benefit to having certain parts of the circuit be more or less reliable, all right? And to, to drive this point home, we're definitely thinking about the possibility that synaptic variance could behave very much like dropout in machine learning to provide some amount of regularization. Um, to continue with dynamics, we now want to use the same synaptic model uh, to capture facilitation and depression. Um, so short-term facilitation and depression both depend on the recent rate of, of presynaptic spikes. So to describe this, all we do is provide the model with some simple mechanisms to increase or decrease its probability of release. Uh, based on spike behavior. And again, we optimize these parameters to explain the data that we recorded. Um, and like before, this effect is strongly cell, cell type dependent. Um, and I want to make the point one more time that this plasticity effectively rewires the circuit on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, right? All of these blue depressing connections become much weaker after just two or three rapid spikes. Um, and during periods of relative quiet, the red facilitating connections can disappear entirely, right? So there are a lot of, of um, there are a lot of new details here, um, but the basic story has actually been known for, for decades, and it's been mostly neglected for that whole time. Um, so we now have models that describe the behavior of our synapses. They, they also allow us, allow us to predict their behavior in response to, to novel stimuli. Um, we could just put the models online and stop here. Um, but with data on thousands of neurons from two, two different species, there's really a, a unique opportunity here to just explore and ask questions like, are there distinct synapse types? Do they fall into nicely separable clusters? Um, what, you know, what is the most natural way for us to organize the data? Um, so I want to show you one answer to, to these questions. Uh, this is the one that we published in our paper. But um, bear in mind that there are many, many ways of looking at the data and probably other viewpoints that are equally valid. Uh, so all we, we did is to take our optimized model parameters, and we re reduce these to two dimensions with UMAP. Um, these results depend only on the strength and the dynamics of the synapse. Uh, we've not included any cell type information in here. Um, first thing we see is that we have distinct clusters for excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Um, that's a nice sanity check. But if we color these synapses by the postsynaptic cell class, uh, what we see is, is that uh, excitatory synapses care a great deal about who they connect to, right? So you have the, this blue and orange lobe on the excitatory cluster, um, whereas inhibitory synapses seem to be more independent of the postsynaptic cell class. And if we dig a little bit deeper, um, we see that uh, even more division between the postsynaptic subclasses. Um, so for example, we've got human and mouse 
E to E connections separating he well here, and then the E to parvalbumin and SST also separating into different sections. Um, so that's weird, okay? Like there's something special about the dynamics of excitatory synapses. Um, and to my knowledge, nobody has yet put forward a satisfying explanation for why this should be. I'm, I'm really curious to hear if anybody has ideas about this. Uh, but we can at least look to see what synapse properties might contribute to this organization. Uh, so on the left here, we see a strong gradient for synaptic strength that mostly runs vertical, which is parallel to the divisions, uh, which is to say that uh, there's a large distribution of synapse strengths, but they seem to have little to do with the, the postsynaptic cell type dependency. Uh, we do see some species differences here. So human synapses tend toward the higher amplitudes, and mouse tends toward the lower amplitudes, but this does not really explain the separation between subclass as well. In the middle here, we have a measure of short-term plasticity. So that's facilitation and depression. Um, and this makes some sense because if you look all the way on the right here, these um, excitatory to SST connections are known to be mostly facilitating. Um, but it doesn't really explain the rest of the map quite as well. Um, and on the right, we have a measure of synaptic variance. Um, and this actually does seem to explain the cell type dependence fairly well. We, uh, we verified this using a classifier to show that variance is more predictive of the postsynaptic subclass than in any other properties, um, which brings me back to my claim that synaptic variance seems to be a key component of the architecture of this, cir this circuit, and um, it's one that I think that we as a field have not given enough attention to. Um, okay, thus ends my soapbox. Um, I want to give my sincerest thanks to the many, many people who contributed to this project. Um, and thank you all for listening. Uh, please visit our website if you want more information. Don't hesitate to reach out. We have time for one or two questions. Very cool. So we all be, will be watching you, OK? So that's the first. Uh, the second is. You are, you are arguing that actually the changes in synaptic uh, strength can change. And then you're saying, well, it's just noise, and it's like dropout. But you can even learn the probability release, uh, 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 release probability. So there could be much more in this. There could be really a, a systematic way you can multiplex uh, these kind of networks. Uh, absolutely. We, we, you know, I'm sure that the story, story goes much, much deeper here, and that there's a lot that we have not been able to get into in terms of uh, long-term changes in plasticity, neuromodulation, all of the things that could affect um, the, you know, the, the variance and, and dynamics of these synapses. Okay. We will take one last question, and this will conclude the session. Very nice work. Uh, this might be a little bit of a dumb question, but uh, what's actually the biological thing that's causing the variance? Is it some Gene expression things, is it so, so the, the biological cause of the variance is, is mostly um, that you have multiple release sites, and these release sites may or may not release a vesicle anytime um, an action potential comes in. So you have this, this sort of stochastic generation of, of vesicle release. Sorry, but I mean, what's um, modulating that? Ah, um, yeah, did not go into that at, at all. Um, and actually, that's, that's a little bit outside my, my range of expertise. Um, there are... There's a lot of literature on the, the development of these synapses um, and, and the various um, genes that, that contribute to uh, release probability um, and the, the genes that contribute to um, the development of axons and dendrites, right? So for example, to decide how many synapses are you gonna create, how many release sites are gonna be within those. Um, so very, very large field that, um, yeah, not terribly familiar with. Let, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much, Luke. And we will come so, back. Sorry. Oh, we will come back to the next session at 10:45. Correct. Thank you. I just wanted to say that we're running five minutes late here, but we're going to restart right on time with the next session. So please be back here at 10:45.
Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. I signed. Yeah, I think they're signed if you want to go around there. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the last day of Cosine 2023. Uh, let's get started on time, so please take your seats as quickly as possible. I know there are not that many people here yet, but we are going to start just to keep things going. So our first speaker this morning is Anne-Marie Oswald, and she will be from the University of Chicago, and she will be telling us about the synaptic dynamics of olfactory learning and behavior. Hello. Um, so I want to thank the uh, organizers for this opportunity to speak. Um, this has been a really fantastic meeting so far, and uh, I'm looking forward to the workshops uh, coming up. OK, uh, today I'm going to talk about the synaptic dynamics that I think underlie uh, olfactory learning uh, learning and memory and behavior. Um, just to orient you to the olfactory system, um, I want you to think of a slice of pizza and the smell of a slice of pizza. And that smell is really a mix of components that uh, the olfactory system very elegantly separates out at the level of the receptors of the nose. And what's really interesting is that when these components combine to these receptors of the nose, there's a unique um, set of uh, receptors that are activated. And that unique set is actually, and that information is actually uh, kept separate as component, uh, as component information um, through, from the nose to the first uh, area of olfactory processing in the brain, which is the olfactory bulb. And then it's elegantly kept separate, separate through the bulb, although there are some lateral interactions. But for the most part, this information stays separated as component information um, until it gets to the olfactory cortex, which is actually just two synapses away from the periphery. And once we get to the olfactory cortex, it's initially kept separate. And then this information is recombined at the level of the cortex in the recurrent circuitry of uh, the cortical circuit. Um, and it is at this circuit um, that we think that the real beginning of olfactory processing um, can, can really happen, and that's to recombine these components um, through the neurons that fire together, the, the idea is that they will wire together through some form of synaptic plasticity, and this enables us to determine the percept um, of pizza. Now, this is relatively simplistic. There's obviously many other areas of the brain involved, but what we were really interested in is the very early stages of this process. Okay, so um, by that token, because we study the olfactory system, we are technically an olfactory lab. 
Um, but what I'm really interested in is like the mechanisms of learning and memory. Um, so from what I mean by that is I'm really interested in is how our weight matrix um, is influenced by our RNN. Now, what I realized on Friday is that I have used the keyword RNN completely incorrectly because I use it in the context of real neural networks. Um, and and I've, my eyes have been opened. And what I'm really interested in is um, how these real neural networks, in particular the microcircuits within them, influence this weight matrix. How do we go about this? Well, we go about this uh, using a variety of techniques, experimental, experimental and computational, and we're trying to work at all levels of the system. We're working right, we start at the synapses, and we're going to build out to behavior and vice versa. Okay, so I'm going to hopefully, to have these, this uh, kind of circle diagram will serve as a roadmap for how we're going to do this throughout the, um, throughout our, our, our uh, uh, how, throughout the experiments I'm going to explain to you. Okay, our first experiment, the one that we were really initially interested in, was do assemblies even form an olfactory cortex? And so we were asked a simple question, do neurons that fire together wire together? And then what information would be represented by that assembly? And then what does this tell us about the underlying mechanisms that might be involved for this assembly to form? And this was the work of three very talented individuals in my lab. Uh, Martha Canto Bustos, who's a postdoc and led this project, Catherine Friesen, a graduate student, and Con uh, Connie Bassey, who um, is also now a graduate student, um, but at the time she was an, uh, a technician in my lab. So I'm gonna start with the behavior. What do these animals do? We started with a very simple foraging task. And all we have to do, all we get the animals to do is learn to dig in a pot labeled, uh, a pot of bedding that is labeled with an odor. If they dig in the pot that's labeled with a rewarded odor, they get a Cheerio. If they dig in the pot that is labeled with an unrewarded odor, they get a timeout. And then what we do is once the animals become expert at this task, we use um, targeted recombination in active populations, or TRAP to label the neurons that were active at the time the animals were performing this task. And we label two assemblies. We label a rewarded assembly, and we relabel an unrewarded assembly. And by nature of this experiment, we have to do this in separate mice. And then what we do is this enables us to, to um, label and also express channel rhodopsin in uh, this population of neurons. And when we do this, we can then take these neurons out of the brain, put them in a dish, and actually record the synapses. And we do this by recording one neuron that we believe is in the ensemble. It'll be tagged with a fluorescent marker, red. And we record a nearby neuron that's outside of the ensemble that we're interested in. And then what we do is we activate a small subset of the population with channel, using channel rhodopsin, and that population is part of the ensemble. And then we compare the within ensemble co connections to the connections from the ensemble to outside the ensemble. So here's some data. This is the uh, task data for the behavior. And what we can see is we, the animals, because this is an innate foraging task, the animals learn this task extremely quickly. They learn it in a couple of days. And once they become expert, we trap and the, the, uh, the network of neurons that are responsive. And we do this by only presenting the animals with the rewarded stimulus in both pots. They think they're brilliant. They get this right 100% of the time, and they do it really quickly. And then what we do is five days later and 10 days later, we actually retest the animals on the original task again, and they continue to perform extremely well. We then record from our neurons, our one neuron that's within the population and our neuron that's uh, outside the ensemble. And what we find for the rewarded ensembles is something that we were really hoping for, was that the um, synapses onto the rewarded neurons within the rewarded so ensemble are much stronger than the synapses onto neurons outside the ensemble. And if we take the ratio of those EPSC amplitudes of, re of the um, within assembly to the outside assembly, we find that that ratio is always much, much greater than one in indicating synaptic enhancement. Now, we were a little bit surprised at what happened with the unrewarded assembly. Now, think of what the unrewarded assembly looks like. When we do the exact same thing to trap the neurons, um, but now the animals get um, the unrewarded mixture compared to the unrewarded mixture, mixture. And this kind of confuses them at first. So they might make a couple of missed um, digs, but really very quickly they learn to correctly reject and restart the trial. 
Um, and then eventually, after a few trials, they get kind of angry and they just give up because there's like they realize there's no sense in getting a reward here. Um, but they've usually they've st stuck to this task for about a half an hour usually. When we look at the synapses in the unrewarded assembly, we can see the uh, the opposite. We often see that some of the synapses become incredibly weak within the ensemble um, compared to neuro, uh, synapses outside the ensemble. And generally that's what happens, and, or often what we see is there's actually no change. And so really we see a big difference between um, the synaptic strengths for the rewarded assembly versus the unrewarded assembly. And I'm showing this in the form of this kind of normalized metric, but when we just look at the raw amplitudes of these synapses, we see that even at the raw amplitude um, values, the raw amplitudes of the rewarded synapses in the rewarded assembly are much stronger than the raw amplitude of the synapses in the unrewarded assembly. In fact, the unrewarded assembly doesn't differ from untrained animals at all. That kind of uh, surprised us because what we really thought was happening was the brain was just recombining this information in, to, to form a percept for mixture A and mixture B. And to be truthful, when we think about these mixtures, the way we set this up, these mixtures are really overlapping. In fact, they have a lot in common, um, meaning that we would expect them to activate kind of the same population of neurons. Um, and the only difference between these two populations is adding in this extra component to the two mixtures. Um, and then what we asked them to do is we asked them to distinguish this and we sent this arbitrary kind of line down the middle of this network. Um, and then somehow these synapses get stronger and the unrewarded assembly synapses seem to get weaker. I feel this is a very tough problem for the brain to solve. And I'm not saying that the brain can't solve it, but I'm saying that the, I think there might be an easier solution here. And one would be to just get rid of all of the irrelevant information in your assembly. And so one of the things that we wanted to test is, is, is there a possibility that this might be happening? And so the way we tested this was by asking the mice, what information are you using to solve this task? So we went back to the mice and what we did was we gave them the foraging task again, but now on 10% of our trials, we just gave them the component that was unique to the rewarded mixture. Or on 10% of the trials, we gave them the component that was you know, more unique to the unrewarded mixture. But not surprising, actually not surprising to us, but the animals were really good at this task. Um, they, they treated the rewarded component as if it was exactly the same as the rewarded mixture. And they treated the unrewarded component at least with respect to digs, as if it were the same as the unrewarded mixture. However, we were somewhat surprised when we looked at the time it took them to do this. In the re for the rewarded component, they, the time that it took them to actually dig in the correct pot was exactly the same as when they dug in the, um, the real full mixture pot. However, in the unrewarded component, what we found is that they eventually did correctly reject. It just took them a really long time to do it. And it was so surprising compared to when we just gave them the two mixtures on their own. Um, and so what we think might be happening here is they're actually teaching, treating this component as somewhat novel. So where does that get us? Well, to summarize, what I've shown you is that the within-assembly synapses are enhanced for the rewarded mixture, but not for the unrewarded mixture, and that the mice can use the component information from the rewarded uh, uh, mixture to perform the task. And this suggests that the enhanced synapses might be part of a component assembly. In contrast, the, contrast, the mice, mice correctly reject unrewarded mixtures, but somehow treat the non-rewarded and non-informative components as novel. And I think this might be important um, for ensuring that new stimuli coming in are still coded. Um, but this also suggests that the mixture itself is suppressed. The mixture information, like the, all the components of the mixtures together, when they're presented together, are suppressed. So this led us to another question, which was what are the circuit mechanisms that actually selectively enhance one component of the, of the, of the assembly um, and suppress the neural activity for the other uninformative components? And we really think that inhibitory circuitry probably plays an important role in this. 
Um, and there's two ways we think that olf olfactory or inhibitory circuitry could possibly do this. The first is by gating. And I don't unfortunately have time to talk about this, this aspect of what we think is going on today. However, I will be talking about this in the workshop tomorrow morning. Um, and it's this is also published work, um, so you can also look it up online. Today, what I want to talk about is competition. How can you mediate competition be the between these two assemblies and have that com competition affect assembly formation. And for this project, it's actually a collaboration between my lab and the lab of Brent Doiron at the University of Chicago. Um, and what, mainly what we asked in this collaboration was, what is, the, what is the role of inhibitory circuitry in mediating synaptic plasticity and assembly formation? And the people who worked on this project, this started as a collaboration between my postdoc, Martha Canto Bustos, and Brent's postdoc, Faresh Delagzi. And then recently, we've added work from Jin Ro Yang. So what did Marta do? Marta ran some experiments. The first thing we wanted to know is how inhibition might change as the animals are learning a task. So what we did um, was we looked at two main inhibitory subtypes, the PV interneurons and the somatostatin neurons. These are really highly expressed throughout the brain um, and very highly expressed in piriform cortex. And what we did was, Marta did, was she drove spiking in the pyramidal cell that she recorded, and then she evoked uh, inhibition at different times relative to that spike using channel rhodopsin. When she did this uh, for PV cells, here's an example where she evoked a spike and then with a short delay evoked inhibition right after that spike. And in this case, this leaded to potentiation of the iPSCs or the inhibitory currents um, following this pairing. In contrast, she did the same thing for somatostatin cells. And in this case, she, had, uh, she evoked the inhibition from the somatostatin cells to ha occur before the spike. Um, and it was in this scenario that she got potentiation. And she did this for all sorts of time steps, pre and post when the spike would happen. And when she did this for the PV cells, she found that Typically, if you were spiked within a 30 millisecond window, either before or either after the spike, what you got was potentiation, strong potentiation. It was, this was a symmetric learning rule. But the SST cells actually showed a very different result. The SST cells showed a result where you got potentiation if you, spiked, if you elicited an inhibition before the spike but you got depression if you elicited inhibition after the spike. And this is a so-called asymmetric rule. Now, the symmetric rule had been shown before. Uh, shout out to Ron Fromke, who I uh, actually had a conversation with at Cosine four years ago now about doing this experiment. And I asked him if he was going to do it. And he said, no, nah, no, nah, go ahead. Uh, and I said, great. Thanks, Rob. Um, but it's other people have shown this result too. Um, and, and, you know, both experimentally this has been shown. And so this has also been integrated into network models. And we found that in network models, and uh, Brent has shown this and, and many other people, uh, many people at this meeting, have shown that this, this, ace, this symmetric learning role actually mediates homeostatic assembly stabilization in networks. But what does the role of this asymmetric inhibitory plasticity rule do? And that was the role we were after. So what we did was we created a spiking network model and some mean field theory um, to really integrate what the roles of these two um, inhibitory learning rules are in a network model. Um, and the model contains the, these learning rules. We also create, uh, put in realistic microcircuit motifs, and then we took that up to the population level where we had two populations that were interacting with each other, two populations of E cells, and that had interesting connectivity through the inhibitory network. There are two key equations in this model. The first one describes the som mediated inhibition uh, within an assembly. That means from S1 to E1, okay? The second one describes the SOM mediated inhibition between assemblies, meaning from S1 to E2. This term here actually describes the relationship between the spike timing dependent plasticity rule and the correlated spiking patterns between the SOM cells and the E cells. And this is conditioned on the SOM cell. So this leads to a situation where the SOM cell leads the E cell, and this leads to potentiation. 
This term is a similar term, and now this is conditioned on the relationship, the spiking relationship pattern from the SOM cell, uh, so from the E cell to the SOM cell. And this is the case scenario where the E cell leads the SOM cell, um, and this leads to um, depression. Now the relationship, this is kind of a tug of war in this equation, and whether or not um, you have more potentiation or more depression in your synapse um, really depends on this term here, which is the weight of the excitatory connection from the E cell to the S cell. So this is hearkening back to what the last talk just talked about. What is the importance of the weight of this, um, this synapse? Um, so what we did was we set that weight to be equal. And when we did that, we looked at the evolution of SOM-mediated inhibition in the model. And what we found is actually nothing very interesting happens. The inhibition within an assembly, so within the E1-S1 network, kind of evolves to a steady state that is not different from the inhibition between the two networks. This isn't very interesting, and it doesn't lead to very interesting dynamics in the network. In contrast, if we set the um, excitation from within a population, E1 to S1, to a much stronger variable um, than the uh, excitation between networks, E1 or E2 to S1, we actually, this is the network actually evolves, and this is just in baseline initialization, will evolve to a, la a, a network that can support lateral inhibition. Now this is a very interesting dynamic that could mediate some really interesting assembly dynamics. So let me talk, talk, take you through some of that. These are the two models I've already discussed. Now perhaps you're thinking maybe the asymmetric learning rule doesn't really matter and it is only the strength of this excitatory connection that makes a difference. I'm gonna tell you that's not true because what we did was we kept that asymmetric excitation consistent, meaning the E1 to S1 uh, excitatory connection was strong while the other was weak. But we then replaced the asymmetric learning rule with the symmetric learning rule. And what we actually got was the inverse of lateral inhibition. Inhibition got stronger within your local network, or within your um, assembly, and actually weaker between assemblies. This is effectively homeostatic um, control of inhibition related to excitation. And just to be fair, round it all out, we made everything symmetric. Um, and again, it just evolves to this kind of not interesting steady state, uh, no differences in inhibition. Okay, so we, what we really wanna know is how does this affect assembly formation? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare two networks, one that has this uh, as double asymmetry, the asymmetry in the excitation and the asymmetry in the learning rule, um, and that's our lateral inhibition network. And we have the other, and we're gonna compare it to our other network or our, our, our null network, which actually doesn't have, uh, doesn't unlock these really cool asymmetries and doesn't show lateral inhibition. And just to kind of point out and remind you that we also have plasticity in the E cell network, and that plasticity is just your standard um, spike timing dependent plasticity uh, rule that was shown by B and Poo way back when. Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna start, we'll walk you through this. This is the phase plot for the um, uniform inhibition network. Okay, and what you see here um, on the y-axis, we've got the strength of excitation between the networks. Um, and then on the x-axis, we've got the strength of excitation within networks. And then what we're showing here are the, are the null clines for this, these two equations. And then we have an unstable fixed point right in the center. How does this, how, let me walk you through this phase plot. So if we, this phase plot is the phase plot you would see right before training. This is the, when the network's initialized. And this is the phase plot that the network kind of snaps back to after training, okay? So after training, you've trained the network for some period of time. It really, what the uh, influence on the assemblies, assembly formation in the network is, is really depends on where you ended up in this phase plot. If you ended up in this quadrant, um, 
the arrows are pointing down and to the left, and that basically means you didn't train the network long enough and you're just going to decay away. Any excit excitation that you, uh, excitatory plasticity that you saw is just gonna decay away. If you get up to this uh, quadrant, what you're going to do is you have really strong connections between the net, uh, neurons, uh, between the two assemblies, and really weak connections within the assemblies, and that really doesn't do well for assembly formation. If you're up here, everybody's strong, okay? So you're within and you're between are strong, so you kind of like everybody's kind of fusing together under those circumstances. And it's really down here in this quad quadrant, which is the sweet spot where you have strong within network connections and weak uh, connections between the two assemblies. Okay, so this is for just the uniform one. Now, the, you might be not surprised to find that the phase plot actually is not that different for our lateral inhibition model, except for one thing. This area, the sweet spot, is much larger in the lateral inhibition network. And where does that get you? Okay, so let's talk about training. So when we train the network, what we're doing is we're giving each assembly, or a potential assembly, E1 and E2, its own set of correlated inputs, and then we're training that correlation into the network, okay? So the goal is to train these little correlations in, and you can kind of see that signature in the raster plot during training. Um, you can see the correlated structure in the E in the, e, in the two E networks, E1 and 2, and you can see some of that echoed in the somatostatin networks as well. Um, if we look at the phase plot diagrams for the training period itself, you'll see everything is just moving to the right in both networks, meaning that we would expect the within, um, um, uh, within assembly uh, synapses to be becoming stronger, um, and this is exactly what we see. They become stronger in both networks, and the between synapses are becoming weaker. Okay, so what happens post-training? What do these networks do? Post-training, we remember, as I said, we snap back to these phase, other phase plots, and we look at the spiking dynamics, and it's pretty hard to see if there's any kind of correlated structure in that network. But what we can do is look at the weights, and we do see that there seems to be some weight structure trained into this network, meaning that the within synapses are stronger and the between synapses are weaker. But this doesn't seem to look too different between our two networks. So what I want you to do is zoom in on just this area, which is the part we're interested in, right? Are we building stronger connections within our unique assemblies? When we do this and we look at this kind of zoomed in and we've kind of plotted them so that they're on the same plot, what we see is actually in our uniform network, the one that doesn't have lateral inhibition, this isn't flat. It's actually slowly declining. So its synaptic strength is slowly getting weaker within this, the ensemble that corresponds to, within the ensembles. Why is this happening? Because when we finished training, we ended up at somewhere around here on the phase plot, and we're just slowly decaying back to rest. However, when we looked at the, when we look at the um, lateral inhibition network, we find that there's actually, not only is there sustained assembly formation, there's actually kind of a reverberant activity which is slowly enhancing the strength of that assembly. And this is post-training. And that's because in this network, when we stopped training, we actually ended up way across the, the uh, null climb here. And we are able to, we're right in the sweet spot, the place where we can enhance our withins and decrease our betweens. The network is able to continue to do this. Okay, so what does this mean? So we suggest that, that from our networks that, that what we've done is we've used um, this kind of asymmetry in the wiring diagram from E cells to SOM cells um, to unlock the power of the asymmetric I, uh, inhibitory spike time independently plasticity rule. And this allows us to achieve stable assembly formation, but with a much shorter time frame. We, de we need to train these networks less. Okay, what about, what about correlations? Remember, the whole point was to try and, you know, uh, tune some correlation structure into these assemblies. Well, when we look at um, the uniform network, 
what we when we look at the correlation structure, and we, what we've got is um, on the left here, we've got the correlations within an assembly, and on the right, we've got correlations between assemblies. What we find is these don't look very different, okay? And actually, these are net negative, meaning that the co correlations within and between are quite weak. However, in the lateral inhibition network, um, we see po strong positive correlation within the network, and we see very strong anti-correlation between the networks. And this is just summarized here. So not only are we training changes in synaptic strength, we're, we're really training the changes in synaptic uh, in correlation structure into this network, and this happens much faster if we're able to go through these asymmetric um, rules. Okay. So this led us, led us to three predictions from this model. The first is that the symmetric inhibitory spike timing dependent plasticity rules, those for the PV cells, um, promote stabilization and, of the assemblies, and they do this through the PV cells. Um, I didn't really focus on this, but this, is, this actually also comes out of our model, which is good because it's consistent with what's been shown before. The asymmetric inhibitory spike timing dependent plasticity rules from, from some interneurons promotes lateral inhibition in this model, assembly competition, and faster learning. And finally, the power of that asymmetric inhibitory spike timing dependent plasticity rule is really unlocked by introducing asymmetric excitation onto some interneurons. So I'm an experimentalist, and so what I want to do is like, you know, does this really exist in my real neural network? So um, I'm going to show you some really super preliminary data um, concerning this um, from, that's coming out of my lab now and some experiments that we're taking on now. So we've moved back, and we're back into our foraging task. And what we're thinking about here is that when we think about our assemblies that we're getting in the foraging task, what our, our task for the rewarded odor, we're kind of thinking of that as like the, the within assembly, the assembly we wanted to form. And the unrewarded assembly is really kind of a competing assembly. Because when the animals are doing this task, one of these is going to get them a reward and one of them isn't. So you can see this seems like a competition thing could be happening. OK? So within our rewarded assembly, what we would expect to see is excitation increases, which is what we do see. We also expe expect to see if PV-mediated inhibition um, is mediating a homeostatic stabilization of that network, we would also expect to see higher and stronger PV-mediated inhibition onto this assembly. But this is our within assembly, and so what we expect to see is that somatostatin-mediated inhibition within this assembly is actually weaker. And conversely, for the competing assembly, we would anticipate that excitation is weaker, which we do see. And correlated with this, the PV-mediated inhibition would be weaker. But because this is the competing assembly, the SST-mediated inhibition onto that assembly would be stronger. So we've set up our experiments to do this. And this is the work of Catherine Friesen, a grad student in my lab. And these are incredibly, I mean, I'm, I'm really simplifying how this experiment is conducted. This is a very difficult experiment. What she's doing is she's labeling the assemblies as we uh, had done before for the excitatory assemblies. But in this case, she will also be driving parvalbumin-mediated inhibition onto our assembly neurons um, or somatostatin-mediated inhibition onto these neurons. I'm just going to give a little teaser of her data set. So well, the first thing she did was she wanted to look at the, how the role of the symmetric inhibitory rule would be to promote homeostatic stabilization of assemblies through PV interneurons. So when she looked, when, how we kind of interpret what that might look like, and this is really just a schematic, is that when we are in the rewarded assembly, the excitation is incredibly strong. And we expect that PV-mediated inhibition would also be strong to stabilize that. Okay, so you don't get runaway excitation. And conversely, in the unrewarded assembly, you would expect that excitation is weak and that to comp to, you don't need super strong inhibition to offset that, and so PV-mediated inhibition would be weak. And what I'm showing here is her data for the rewarded ensemble, where she's looked at PV-mediated inhibition onto a neuron within the ensemble 
and a neuron outside the ensemble. And so far, I, th I think she's done pretty good because in four out of six of the pairs that she's tested, she's actually seen that inhibition onto our ensemble neuron is stronger than inhibition outside the ensemble. You know, this is not a data set we can statistically analyze yet. We're still kind of underpowered, um, but it's going in the right direction. And she looked at the same rule for the asymmetric network, looking at this again onto the um, rewarded ensemble. And what she found, and what you would expect to find here, is that when the rewarded ensemble, um, uh, in the rewarded ensemble, you would actually expect some mediated inhibition to be quite weak. This is what the model predicts. Um, so weak inhibition within the ensemble, strong inhibition outside the ensemble. So unrewarded one or the competing assembly will receive stronger lateral inhibition. And when she does this, she does indeed find that in four out of six pairs, seems to be a good number, um, four out of six pairs, the inhibition is actually weaker within the assembly than it is outside the assembly. Um, and so this is also trending in the correct direction. And I want to note, also note, in comparison to PV-mediated inhibition, this inhibition is generically weaker. Um, and so this is potentially also very interesting. Now what she's got to do is we've also have to label the unrewarded assemblies and repeat this set of the studies and of course get a few more in here. But this is really kind of going in the direction that we think the model um, it, that, that the model is predicting. And so we think this is be potentially the basis for supporting the model. And finally, we do want to look at whether or not the um, excitation onto the somatostatin uh, cells is asymmetric. Um, this is going to be a little bit more complicated, and it is much like we have to run the experiment much like the ones that were described in the previous um, talk where you have to record from multiple neurons at once and get their connectivity parameters and then condition those parameters based on their connectivity structure. And so when, if anybody wants to see this, you know, well, we submitted a grant. Um, this is AIM-2. Okay. All right. So just to summarize and, and, and tell you where we are so far. We're, we've I've shown you that the weight matrix for our, our assemblies um, is enhanced for neurons responding, to, uh, for an ensemble of neurons that respond to the rewarded stimuli. But it does not differ from untrained ensembles for unrewarded stimuli. We use our model to show you that competition between assemblies may be mediated by lateral inhibition that arises due to the asymmetric inhibitory spike timing dependent plasticity rule, as well as asymmetries in the SOM to E or E to SOM connections. And finally, we've got some really promising data that's really starting to support some of these model predictions. So I want to thank you for your time and your attention. Um, I also want to thank the members of my laboratory, um, particularly Catherine, Marta, Connie, and Sam, who all contributed to this project, um, as well as my collaborator, Brent Doiron, and his postdoc, Faresha, and graduate student, Jin Ro, who have did all of the modeling work for this, and, of course, my funding source. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Emory. We have time for some questions. Hi, Christiane. Hi. Very beautiful. It's my dream experiment that you have done, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> I have a comment and a question. So my comment is, you seem to be ignoring everything that will happen in the bulb when animals do this task. I'm sorry, pardon me? You seem to not be taking into consideration plasticity in the olfactory bulb. So this is just a comment. So a lot of mm -hmm. what you see could already be coming in from the bulb in a changed manner, not happening in cortex. My second question is, um, what would happen if you used a two alternative choice task where you have two assemblies that are rewarded? What do you expect to see? Right. Okay. So in answer to your first um, question, um, I, this does not exclude any changes that are happening in the bulb or even in higher cortical areas contributing to their ability to do this behavior. Uh, absolutely. Um, all I'm showing is that there are changes present in the olfactory cortex. Uh, in answer to your second question, we've been wanting to do that experiment <laughs> um, because that really forces the animals to learn mixtures as opposed to just 
feature discrimination, which is really what they're doing in this task. Um, initially, we, uh, we would, I'd love to say that we, we totally went in planning that this is the way this was going to turn out. Um, we were wrong. This was a kind of a happy accident in, in what we found. So yes, I absolutely want to do that experiment. What do I think will happen? I think we're going to see assemblies forming for mixtures. Um, but it's going to be a little bit harder to tease those apart, and we're going to need some in vivo recording to do that. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I'm actually wondering, what do these uh, assemblies represent? Are they representing the order that is getting rewarded, or are they actually representing the action of go versus no go? Because yeah. what, let, let's say these assemblies are getting sculpted during training, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if you do a reversal learning and keep on switching right. what is getting rewarded and what is not, right? Then. Yeah. yeah. Awesome question. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. To all of that, we don't know. The assumption is that it's coding for order. Order. That's not necessarily true. It could be, and and, and where more and more evidence is actually showing that that neurons in piriform cortex actually respond to lots of other task parameters. Um, and so, really, the only thing that we can do at this point, and what we are setting up to do, is to run this task in an environment where we can record the neural activity of these specifically labeled populations in addition to knowing their synaptic dynamics. And then when we know what those neurons are really responding to, then we can really like hammer home what the, what the network is coding for. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Very nice results with the SOM cells. I think I missed this. Are the E1 and E2 populations actually spatially distributed so is it actually lateral inhibition or is this like conceptually it's conceptual lateral? so they're inhibition. Intermixed. there's no there's no space in our model no. okay so the e1 and e2 are really intermixed nearby. Mm -hmm. okay yeah hey thanks that was great so when you measure the excitation onto the two trapped populations the rewarded and the non-rewarded mm -hmm. was that purely the direct effect of the excitatory plasticity or when you were making those measurements, inhibition was engaged. And so inhib inhibitory plasticity is also important for the strengthening kind of in the moment. Right. Um, so because we're driving populations, we can't totally rule out the possibility that inhibition might be involved. Um, what we are doing is because because it's a channel redoption, we're, we're really trying to make that stimulation as weak as possibly we can. So we're only eliciting a spike. And the idea, the possibility of, of multi-synaptic paths is, is weaker under those conditions. We do our best to limit that, although we cannot entirely rule it out. OK, so ultimately, then, you think what's driving the behavioral changes is the excitatory strengthening, and the inhibitory so. plasticity is driving the learning. Yeah. The, okay. Also, why? What mechanistically do you think is different about the PV and SOM learning rules? Why do you get symmetric in one case and asymmetric in the other? Yeah, we haven't like like if you're talking like you know what's happening in the actual mechanism is it presynaptic, postsynaptic? Yeah. We haven't dug into that. Um, and and honestly, I haven't even dug into the liter literature to determine what it might be. So so the answer is I don't know. Let's thank Anne Marie one more time. All right, so the second talk of today's, or of this session at least, is flexible neuromodulation of synaptic strengths via electrical shunting in dendritic spines. And it'd be presented by Hyolong Cho from Yale University. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Hiram Cho. I am a graduate student at the um, John Murray Lab in Yale, and I'm excited to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in collaboration with Amy Arnston's lab on modeling the flexible neuromodulation of synaptic strengths in dendritic spines. What you're looking at in front of you are dendritic spines. These are micron-sized membranous protrusions that cover the dendritic tree of pyramidal neurons. These spines are the primary sites of excitatory glute glutamatergic synapses, and their spine density and morphology differs across the cortical hierarchy, suggesting that spines play important roles in circuit computations that are specialized across areas. 
So what are the computational functions of spines? And this has been a mystery for quite a while now. Um, but there have been multiple proposals for what that purpose may be. And we can generally, generally summarize these into three hypotheses. One is linear input integration. Spines may serve as ways to linearly combine input from different presynaptic sources. Second is chemical compartmentalization. In particular, calcium compartmentalization by spines could shape long-term synaptic plasticity at individual synaptic sites. And finally, spines may be electrically isolated compartments if the spine neck resistance is sufficiently high. And whether spines are capable of electric compartmentalization has been a topic of debate in experimental and modeling studies over the decades, mainly because of the technical challenges involved in measuring such a small structure. Only the last decade or so have optical imaging techniques become sensitive enough to get measurements of the neck resistance. And intriguingly, they reveal that spine neck resistances can actually be very high. So for example, the study last, that was published last year from Raphael Uste's lab um, used two photon imaging measurements of mouse sensory cortex in vivo to find that find not only spine, depo spine only depolarizations at resting membrane potentials, but a significantly high resistance on the order of mega ohms. So these measurements establish electrical compartmentalization, raising important questions on how electrical properties can actually affect spine function. Spines also contain complex molecular machinery and a variety of specialized receptors and channels. In prefrontal cortex, this machinery is well suited for neuromodulation to shape synaptic integration. So in this schematic, for instance, spine, the spine is depolarized through AMPA and NMDA receptors. Internal calcium concentration can increase through NMDA currents. And neuromodulators, such as norepinephrine and dopamine, can then activate receptors that can have functions like increasing internal calcium stores along the signaling pathway. Then calcium can either directly or indirectly lead to opening of shunting channels located in the spine, neck, or head, such as the SK and KCNQ potassium channels or HCN channels. And these shunting channels are well positioned to actually leak out charge from synaptic excitation and weaken the effective depolarization measured at the soma. On a broader scale, these neuromodulators have a narrow inverted U influence on persistent neuronal firing associated with working memory. So moderate levels of internal calcium release may support persistent firing by depolarizing the spine to unblock NMDA receptors. And that's basically what I was talking about in the earlier slide. However, high levels of norepinephrine or dopamine, such as when you're stressed, can actually increase calcium release and activate downstream signals, which open shunting channels in the spine neck, weakening the synaptic strengths and taking these working memory circuits offline. There are therefore remarkably powerful neuromodulatory actions in dendritic spines that can strengthen or weaken recurrent circuit connections. So now we have a simplified picture of a spine where Current from the synaptic input can either flow out through the spine neck and into the dendrite, then to the soma, or be shunted out through potassium channels. Ultimately, we want to test if the neuromodulatory control of calcium signaling can be used to control the shunting to flexibly scale synaptic strengths. We want to test this in conjunction with the notion that spines are electrically compartmentalized to see whether this neuromodulatory control is even biophysically plausible. And in order to do that, we're going to use experimentally constrained multi-scale computational modeling. So let's get right to it. We're first going to start with a minimal model of a spatially extended neuron. This model is subdivided into compartments, including a soma, a single dendrite, and a spine. Cable theory is then used to integrate diffusion equations to find the evolution of voltage in different regions of the neuron over time. We then add receptors and relevant molecular regulation in the spine, and using experimental re experimentally realistic values to constrain the simulation, we can see whether or not potassium channel shunting can be a mechanism for synaptic control. So zooming in, this is our picture of a minimal spatial neuron model. You've got um, input through NMDA and AMPA receptors, and we also have calcium sources in the form of NMDA current and internal calcium stores, that's the little blob on the left, and 
We also have calcium activated potassium channels. In this case, we're using the SK channel. So to examine the role of electric compartmentalization, we're first going to take a look at what happens if we increase that spine neck resistance highlighted over here. So here I'm going to show you a time series of the potential at the spine head in response to a single spike input. As we can see, the overall de depolarization of the spine head, spine head at low resistances starts out very low. But increasing the neck resistance can dramatically increase the depolarization in this region. And at very high resistances, something interesting happens. The shape changes. We now have an NMDA plateau with a sustained response. So that, that becomes very important. Why is that? Because now we, we can investigate this plateau further if we look into the ratio of NMDA to AMPA current. So as a reminder, NMDA is generally longer time scales, AMPA much shorter. And if we look at that ratio, we can see and plot that as a function of spine neck resistance, we can see that it dramatically increases non-linearly at very high spine neck resistances. And correspondingly, the voltage at the head also increases very quickly as well. So, and the, what you're seeing on the bottom is the integrated um, voltage at the head. So from here, we can start to define our idea of modulation. And so we're going to consider two different cases. One where, given the spine model, the potassium channel is open due to the effects of neuromodulation, and one where it is not. We can then plot the time series of the voltage potential at the SOMA for these two cases, closed being dotted and open being solid. And it would look something like this. We can quantify this difference in the SOMA by defining what we might call a modulation index, which is really the sum of the current into the, the percent difference of the integrated current into the SOMA in closed and open cases. And then this quantity can then be plotted against fine neck resistance to find the modulation as a function of resistance. And what you're going to find is two regimes of modulation. So if we plot that modulation index as a function of resistance, we get something like this, where you do see that dramatic nonlinear increase, and we can identify two regimes here. One is this very high regime in which um, the NMDA plateau potential can occur, and the modulation index can be very high. And we'd see something that looks like this. Because even weak shunting conductance can block the generation of NMDA plateaus. So you see a very dramatic difference in the overall voltage at the SOMA. In, these low in this low resistance regime, the shunting effect is very small, pro providing modulatory control of only a few percent. But overall, modulation index does increase with neck resistance. Elaborating further on low resistances. Does that mean that, oh, we can't achieve modulation at these lower resistances? Not exactly, because in our um, model of the spine, we should note that there's another parameter here, which is effectively the conductance of this SK channel. And this can be affected by different neuromodulatory mechanisms such that you can increase the conductance or decrease it um, depending on the amount of neuromodulation. If we do that, if you decrease it, for instance, you can completely suppress the amount of shunting, mod shunting modulation. But if you increase it, even by just one order of magnitude, you can get sufficient, significant increases in modulation. If we increase it again, you get even higher. Um, so this tells you that, yes, you can achieve um, modulation even at these low resistances. And if we were to look for instance, at this point over here, you can see that was the point I showed earlier of very low resistance. If we increase that by one order of magnitude, you can see significant suppression here of that initial spike signal and the following NMDA transient. Um, so the next step of this project is to embed this spine shunting mechanism into, into a recurrent cortical circuit models to examine their functional impacts, especially on attractor dynamics of persistent activity in working memory circuits. So we will characterize the effective transfer function of current into the soma as a function of biophysical spine parameters so that we can scale our control mechanism in spiking rate models without having to simulate so many individual spines. So this here, I'm showing you a standard ring model of working memory, where um, a spatial location is to be remembered and stored as a bump of persistent activity, which is somewhat resistant to intervening distractors. So what that would look like, for instance, is if I give a stimulus here, this stimulus can be preserved um, 
even with the presentation of a distracting signal somewhere else um, due to the precise balance of excitation and inhibition. If we were to include our findings from these single model studies of spines, um, and like I said, get this effective transfer function, we can find that um, as recurrent, we, we can find that the shunting mechanism um, can weaken recurrent strengths and the effect, and if you weaken the recurrent uh, um, excitatory strength of the circuit, the effective regime of the circuit can change from filtering distractors to being distractible and shifting the memory. So these shifts to distractible and working memory failures are consistent with the effects of neuromodulation during stress. So when you're stressed, you are more distractible. This is the, this is the type of thing we expect to see. We therefore plan to extend our studies from the biophysics of individual spines to recurrent networks to examine how neuromodulation can flexibly shift the circuit across different computational regimes. So in conclusion, I talked to you about how electrical compartmentalization of spines in experimentally constrained ranges can have dramatic effects on voltage and calcium dependent feedback loops. I also talked to you a bit about how shunting channels can potently scale synaptic strengths and provide a locus for flexible neuromodulatory control of cortical circuit function. And our future steps are really to do more detailed modeling of the biophysical machinery. This means um, more detailed modeling of the release of internal calcium stores, the camp PKA signaling pathways, and also to embed this spine transfer function into recurrent network models of um, working memory. Finally, I just want to acknowledge my advisor, John Murray, and our collaborator, Amy Arnstein. Um, and yeah, so thanks to them, and if you, you could find my email if you need to contact me. Thank you. Great. We have some uh, quite a bit of time for questions, Tim. Uh, hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, you started out with a spine neck resistance estimate of 256 mega ohms, but then you only showed us resistivity numbers. Oh, yes. Um, so sorry. Wh where I are didn't you? mean to mention that. Uh, yeah, so this regime I'm talking about here um, is actually within the experimentally plausible regime. So you should imagine that everything is shifted by um, so everything is shifted by about two orders of magnitude. So effectively, um, around ten, a little above ten to the four is um, where the uh, experimentally measured result is. So, so you're saying that 10 to the 4 ohm centimeters would translate to 250 mega ohms? Yes. So what kind of spine neck diameter are you assuming here? Uh, what kind of spine neck diameter? So everything's on the order of microns. Um, so the length is about 0 0.66 um, micrometers. And the across, it's going to be about point, I, I guess, point oh, point 0.3 microns, I think. 0.3 mi OK. Yeah. I, all right, let's All right. let's take it offline. Okay. Hi. A quick question. So, how many other potassium channels have you tested in your model? Because here, I think you're trying so, just the SK, right? Yes, we um, mainly um, use the SK channel simply as a demonstration of shunting. Um, right. We so really right now this project is at the stage where we've just done it with the SK channel, but the plan is to do this to extend the study for KCNQ and HCN. But also BK channels, you know, we have. And yes, that, yes, that, absolutely, okay. yes. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering how spine specific this effect is. Um, what if you put the SK conductance out on the dendritic compartments instead of in the spine? What, how would that affect things? Um, so I think the overall mechanism. If we were, for instance, to take all of these molecular compartments and transfer them to the dendrite. Sure, sure, but the I think the point is that these molecular mechanisms are found in the spines, and that is where the um, I, I meant more the electrical effects, not not the molecular. Oh, the electrical yeah. compartmentalization. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the electric compartmentalization of the dendrite, or um, for instance, but I would say that it is spine specific in the sense that the way the spine is shaped and its diameter, its specific morphology heavily influences whether or not you can even achieve that high resistivity. Because for the rest of the neuron, you we typically as, assume um, resistivities of about um, 
a hundred um, ohm centimeters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think a comment on on the same uh, because you know the selectivity of the activation of channels can be depending on the spine shape as well, right? So the selectivity or the the activation of the channels can also be depending on the spine shape, right? So for example, if you yes, yes. Around, so the um, if you look, for example, at VK channels, right? I mean, which are calcium and voltage activated. Yeah, uh, yeah. So absolutely. You know, we, um, we have shown that they're selectively activated in, only in a subset of spines. So I think related to the last question, I think. Right. Right. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Let's thank. Let's thank Hill one more time. Thank you. Okay, the last speaker for this session is uh, going to tell us about balanced excitation inhibition, which could help estimate gradients. And the speaker is, I'm sorry, that is. Yeah. But you're not Estelle Chan, are you? I'm not, yeah. Um, but I, I should have a presenter display. Okay, um, so uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, this talk was set to be uh, presented by Estelle Shen, an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, who couldn't make it today because uh, of a visa issue. Um, uh, I'm stepping in in her stead. Um, I want to also thank Conrad and Richard, who have been very helpful in this project. Uh, so empathize uh, with you will, if you will, for a second with your premotor cortex, uh, attempting to initiate the movement to pick up a much needed cup of coffee. Uh, the correct uh, uh, activation depends on how that information is, is used as it's transformed through motor cortex, uh, and then uh, through the brainstem, the body, and then potentially out as well into the world and to a reward estimate. Uh, we can generalize the problem uh, that is, uh, optimal activity needs to solve um, <clears throat> with uh, the gradient. Um, so the gradient, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, uh, essentially says uh, how any particular, uh, how a small change in activity affects activity somewhere else. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to bracket the question of where that somewhere else might be and focus on the circuit mechanisms uh, in an uh, area I'll label H as, as to how that might happen. Um, uh, broadly, uh, this work is part of a broader field attempting to uh, ask the circuit me mechanisms for gradient estimation. Uh, there are now a, a great number of... Um, uh, of, of families of models, more publications than I could, I could possibly list uh, of ways that could happen, including target propagation related algorithms, predictive coding, and neuromodulatory based algorithms, and others. Um, in this talk, I'll start with the problem of gradient estimation and work backwards. Uh, the path we'll take brings us most, most closely to target propagation and predictive coding. Uh, <clears throat> The particular physiology we hope to explain is particularly related to inhibitory circuitry. Uh, a great deal is now known about inhibitory circuitry, its importance in gating, for example, critical period plasticity. Uh, you just heard uh, some about inhibitory plasticity rules. Uh, and a good deal is known as about how those relate to the production of a tight um, inhibitory balance. In addition, we know a great deal about uh, inhibitory circuit motifs. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on the predominant, predominant production patterns of parvovulmin and somatostatin positive neurons. As an outline, I'll first start with our derivation, uh, show how that might link to inhibitory balance, and finally present some validation in simulations. So the first step in our, uh, in our derivation is to write an objective function. We're going to examine the class of objective functions that can be written 
as a log probability of some target given uh, our, our home area. Uh, and this is a pretty large class of objective functions. It includes classification with the cross entropy loss, for example, or mean squared error. And the fact that we can write this as a log probability will become important. And our goal is to update the synaptic weights in H and in general change its activity so that H changes in the direction of the gradient of this conditional log probability. Now, our, our derivation um, begins in earnest when we apply Bayes' rule to this log probability. And this is arguably the central step in the target propagation family of algorithms. Uh, Writing the conditional, uh, right, applying Bayes rule in, in this in the setting, and I've applied the log and derivative here, gives us two terms. On the left, we can think of this as the score of the conditional log probability distribution of H given the target. And on the right, we have the score of the marginal distribution of H. We can think further about these in terms of the flow of information in this system. The score of the conditional depends on the rejection of, of feedback information from our target, whereas the score of the marginal distribution depends only on local information. I want to emphasize at this point that this is uh, an exact relation, and any algorithm for credit assignment or gradient estimation for this class of objectives can be split into these two terms and analyzed in that way. Uh, now, perhaps. Uh, 15 years ago or so, this might have seemed a dead end. We've replaced one hard problem with another, but uh, luckily we're now in 2023 and there are some wonderful methods for score estimation. Um, these methods underlie some of the state-of-the-art methods for image generation, uh, known as uh, uh, drift uh, or, or diffusion, um, denoising diffusion probabilistic modeling. Uh, and uh, uh, in general, the approach here is to approximate the score as the difference between a denoising prediction, uh, given some, some, some noise epsilon, uh, and this works for a few classes of noise, but particularly for Gaussian noise. Uh, and then uh, the score is, lies in the same direction as the difference of that denoising estimate with the original uh, value. Um, what's nice about this is it suggests a potential circuit Mechanism. And in our imagination, we uh, imagine a, a local projection to, uh, um, uh, to a class of interneurons, probably, uh, probably even positive. Um, and uh, these neurons, if they receive a, a noisy version of local activity, uh, noisy potentially through synaptic transmission, and they then attempt to predict local activity as best they, best they can, uh, their estimate would act as an, as a overall uh, um, an estimate of the score. Um, if if this is the case, it uh, might be seen as another way to uh, to justify observations of tight DI balance. And uh, by that, um, I'm referring to the phenomenon that um, uh, at fast time scales, uh, inhibitory and excitatory balance uh, currents. Uh, track each other closely. And this is hard to measure in this classic study. Uh, two nearby neurons with correlated activity uh, were set in voltage clamp, one in one mode and the, one in the other. Uh, and you can see that uh, currents track quite closely. Now we can plug this score estimate into our uh, Bayes equation. Uh, we'll apply the marginal score with uh, this local denoising prediction. And we can do the same trick for the, uh, for the conditional score. Um, you'll see that the H's here will cancel the local activity itself, leaving the simple difference between two terms, a feedback prediction uh, and a local prediction. Um, what's nice about this is it resembles uh, simply in its, in its simple difference, uh, the local postsynaptic potential. Uh, and we predict as well, because we're talking about a normative principle for learning, that learning at these feed-forward synapses should be proportional to that difference. Uh, as a final note, um, this feedback may be imprecise and, and biased. Uh, and if that's the case, then learning would as well be biased. Uh, and so to minimize this problem, we can attempt to control uh, as, as best as we can. And for this, we introduce 
another population of neurons, putatively somatostatin positive, which subtracts away that bias. This leaves a final uh, a, uh, corrected learning rule uh, in which uh, we uh, simply have a, a sum of uh, excitatory currents into this cell, feed forward and feedback, and a subtraction of the two predictions. Um, one trained to predict feed forward and the other trained to predict feedback. So at this point, uh, I started with gradient estimation. Uh, I promised uh, how we would be able to link that to the notion of tight EF balance. And to get there, uh, provided a bridge of score estimation, and in particular, denoising score estimation. Uh, there are two circuit motifs that we use to do this, a marginal and a conditional, uh, which uh, in, in our model we, we imagine as integrated in, in basal and apical um, compartments, respectively. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to tie to some very closely related work in the literature. And, and we took particular inspiration from a method called difference target propagation, um, which can almost be seen in a similar way in, in early writings by Yashio Benjiu, uh, indeed is justified in this way. Um, it's only small differences in, uh, in, in what the target is. Um, the difference with our algorithm is that, well, the feedback prediction is, is the same. We're using the same method. But the denoising prediction in DTP uh, reuses a forward and backwards autoencoding loop. So it reuses these backwards connections. Biologically, this would require that feedback happens twice through the same connections. Uh, and this is nicely suited for strict layer-wise networks, but um, I'm still here. Uh, I'm still presenting. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, uh, in, in more in more unstructured networks, it's hard to define. Um, I also want to tie this to the notion of dendritic predictive coding, uh, which produces a picture very close to what we're presenting. Um, it's it's almost hard to spot the differences. And uh, in in relation to this body of work, uh, our our notion is. Uh, is um, uh, simply the addition of an interpretation in terms of gradient estimation and a justification why. Now, there are other proposals as to linking uh, predictive coding uh, with gradient estimation. Uh, our perspective is score estimation provides another way one can make that link. Now, we did uh, uh, implement this idea in some simple simulations. Um, we're using a direct feedback mo motif um, it, this is a very flexible approach in terms of where that feedback is coming. Um, we uh, do observe uh, some uh, gradient uh, alignment, so we can look at the cosine of the angle of the true gradient, which we calculate um, uh, with this estimate. Uh, however, it's not very high, and uh, in, uh, in comparison to backpropagation, as well as other algorithms such as uh, difference target propagation, um, in our hands, this algorithm is, is performing a good bit worse. And we're unclear exactly why this is the case, um, but we do think it has something to do with the, uh, the relative dynamics of these three networks that we're now requiring, the feedback, uh, the, the local predictions, and the feed forward that need to match. Um, difference target propagation nicely subtracts away a, um, uh, an error term that here, uh, the feed forward and I mean the the uh, feedback and local predictions uh, need need to have uh, hopefully if they both have errors as correlated errors as possible. Um, so we're still working through uh, what, exactly what we're missing, um, but we do know that at least uh, some of the biological phenomena that we're attempting to re reproduce, including uh, this notion of tight E balance, um, is matched. So on the left here, I have. Uh, in one node in, uh, in this network, the, um, uh, these four currents before training and on the right after, and you can see that they match quite closely. So at this point, uh, I'd like to conclude and, and uh, thank uh, Estelle and as well everyone and the broader literature in which uh, 
this is situated. Um, Estelle is an undergraduate currently looking for PhD programs. If you like this work, uh, please uh, reach out. Um, so overall, we, we, we uh, propose one particular way in which balanced inhibition could help estimate gradients. Uh, and broadly are pushing for this perspective of seeing gradient estimation as score estimation. Thank you. All right, we have time for one or two quick questions. Hi, Ari, uh, very beautiful talk. I was wondering, you mentioned these direct feedback connections in your MNIST experiments. Yes. Are they learned or are they uh, fixed and random? Or yeah, how do you take mm -hmm. care of that? Yeah, those are learns uh, to, uh, to predict a given net target, to predict that feed forward activity as best as possible. So it's a local, it's a local learning rule. Okay. Um, can be in prediction term. Okay, thanks. One more question. Uh, you mentioned that the feedback term in the uh, gradient estimate is biased somehow. Uh, can you explain again, or do you have an intuition where this bias comes from? Uh, one possibility is simply the dimensionality of the signal that it is, is using to predict a higher dimensional signal. Um, there's always going to be some subspace it doesn't, it doesn't catch. Um, if the target, say, is 10-dimensional, but your population is 1,000-dimensional, um, so that's, what, that's one possibility, but we're still trying to pin that down. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers from this morning. And we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock for the last session of the meeting. Thank you. Yep, on that note, we're going to have our Gatsby keynote speaker at 2 o'clock. Friends, Deval, please join us for that. <laughs>